Martin Henderson, welcome to my podcast. Thanks, Dominic. I appreciate it, mate. Mate, I, I appreciate you being here. And shit, you are, you are just as handsome in real life as what you are on Virgin oh, River. Oh, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of makeup and lighting that goes into that. Um, I was watching an episode of it last night. Jeez, the arms. Do you, you, you do look smaller now than what you look in Virgin River. Do you, do you have like a workout regime that you yeah, I do t- to get jacked up for that? Jacked up for Jack. Um, <laughs> yeah, I do tend to. I've just been, um, I've actually been unwell recently. So that's part of, yeah, I haven't really been exercising the way that I normally do. I had to go into a hospital for an emergency procedure about two months ago. So, oh, you okay? I'm fine now. Yeah, thankfully, thanks to good doctors. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but normally, yeah, I try. I try to work out. I think mm. for my mental health as much yeah. as anything, it, it's super important. Jeez, and you're you're turning fifty in October. You're looking good. You you you're feeling good. I just about spat my, <laughs> my water out when you said that number. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I was feeling good until you brought that up. <laughs> Man, I'm, I'm I'm envious. I'm I'm just about to turn fifty one. Oh, you look um, good. Come on. Come thank on. you. I I feel like you're I have great. got. Um, better looking with age, but you, 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 look, you look at shots of you, you've never had an ugly face. It's, oh. it's not like you've grown into being 50. You've just been handsome, a handsome fucker the whole way through. Yeah, handsome fucker. You're very kind. Uh, that makes me nervous. What are you really going to ask me? I feel like you're buttering me up here. <laughs> no, no, absolutely not. I'm just, I'm, I'm honoured that you're oh, here. That's um, sweet. Thank I, you. I do, I do do quite a bit of research for my guests that come on the podcast. Um, a lot of that research involves like seeing what's on YouTube, uh, seeing what other podcasts I've been on, have you? Is this your first podcast? I did one podcast with Kim Crossman in LA. Oh, a pretty few, depressed. Yes, a yeah. few years ago. Um, I'd known Kim from sort of Shorten Street circles for years, and I, I'd actually come across it uh, separate to her, and I just heard sort of the. I felt what she was trying to put out there was really important. And yes. then she said, would I come on? And so, I, yes, I did that. Right. So well, I'm not a virgin. See. I'm not. This is <laughs> from Virgin River, but not a, vir- not a podcast virgin. No. Um, okay. Geez, there's so much to unpack with you. It's been, um, it's been a hell of a life and a hell of a career. And I feel like you're just sort of hitting your straps now at middle age. Um, uh, but, uh, but, you know, it, it's quite funny. Like when you, when you live in New Zealand and you watch your career, it feels like greatest hits. It's like, oh, yeah, Martin's on Shortland Street. Martin's in Australia. Martin's on a Nicolas Cage fucking movie. Martin's <laughs> doing a thing with Naomi Watts. But when you when you dig beneath the surface, there's a lot of a lot of downtime in between these things. So I'm guessing there's a hell of a backstory and a lot of adversity and a lot of struggle for the artist. Yeah, there is, um, and I don't want it to be a poor me story because I. Well, it's a happy ending. Yeah, I do. I, <laughs> Uh, I, do, <laughs> I do feel fortunate in a way because I felt like some things went my way. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe in luck per se. I think you create your luck mm-hmm. by creating opportunity and seizing opportunity and withstanding the inevitable adversity. Um, and that's not luck. That's probably more about perseverance and, and believing in yourself and tenacity and all those sort of character things that you've got to build up. Um, and I definitely had a huge amount of challenges around just sticking it out. But at the same mm. time, I do feel lucky, you know, I, I kind of, I felt like when I arrived into Calif- into LA originally, um, I, I got an agent and a manager overnight, you know, and I know a lot of people that just, just that little step towards their Hollywood dream can take a long time and there's a lot of rejection just trying to get representation but because i had a pretty substantial body of work both in australia and new zealand prior to going there that certainly was a nice calling card you know and i think representatives were like oh okay this kid's worked in new zealand australia he's got some chops so let's sign him and hopefully you know something Mm -hmm. happens um but then once you've got the the agent and the manager you know there's uh, all the, the the auditioning and the and the setbacks and the mm. rejection and the politics within Hollywood and who knows who and yeah but that's part of what I'm intrigued about you though because um there there are so many so many so many crossroads in the Martin Henderson story where you could have taken the easy road and you didn't you took the other one like you could have and and this is this is no discredit to him whatsoever because it's been a hell of a career but um Michael Galvin who's Dr Chris Warner on Shortland Street yeah started at the same time as you He's had a wonderful career, just remaining on, on Shortland Street. You could have done that. You could have stayed on Home and Away or one of the shows in Australia, but instead you made life difficult for yourself many, many times. 
Yeah, I, I guess I did. Um, <laughs> my dad. I mean, okay, no, no, I, th- I think that's a fair assessment. My dad brought that up when I was in LA, um, and I, you know, th- it was rough, and I was struggling to get sort of my career really started, and and he suggested I come home. You know, he's like, mate, he said, I, I understand you want to be like Russell Crowe, and I get that. I, I can understand, but. But you've got a career in New Zealand, you know, and Australia. You, you could just come home. And he was sort of trying to open the door um, to me to take that easier option. Um, but it's not what I wanted, you know. Mm. I think I think from you a really – I did from a really early age. And, and I saw that possibility. And I think it would have been hard for me to ignore that potential because then I feel like I would have been letting myself down because they were – it was about what I had seen and what I thought – I would like to achieve and um also i got yeah i remember on shorten street i was getting ready to negotiate my last year on that and uh i'm not gonna say his name but anyway the producer <laughs> <laughs> um during the negotiations i sort of said well I, you know i think i'll do one more year and then i'm gonna go and he's like and he said well, where are you gonna go and i'm like i don't know i want to go i want to do film and and he laughed at me and he just and he said you can't do film you can't do film. And I think when someone tells me I can't do something. The fuck I can't. I was like, yeah. So I think that that one conversation was actually uh, probably the very opposite of what he was mm. angling for. Because I think he wanted me to stay. And I was yeah. like, but when he said I couldn't, I was like, all right, fuck you. I will. Um, <laughs> I'll prove you. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Hate, I haters are your motivators. Sometimes, there's, yeah. There's, um, there's a saying I really like, and I feel like it applies to you. It's, it goes something like... Um, a ship is safe in the harbour, but that's not what ships are for. Yeah, yeah. I like that saying a lot. Yeah. 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 So, okay. And so you've got to lo- lo- lose sight of the shore for a long time mm. before you find a new land. And it's a know? terrifying thing. Oh, it is. It's, it's yeah, it, it's challenging and mm. it's scary. And then, of course, all the demons come up, the self-doubt, the insecurity, you know, am I enough? Have I done the right thing? You know, all the, just that mental chatter that can kind of limit your your own ambition and belief in yourself and then that then then the real work starts you know it's not about <laughs> having acting chops you know it's figuring out who you are as a, as a person yeah it's that deep sort of dark night of the soul stuff where you're confronted with how much you believe in yourself how much you love yourself um what you value you know what your dreams really are because it can it, i think it's very easy to listen to what everybody else wants for you um and I actually was very fortunate uh, just before doing The Ring. You mentioned Naomi Watts. Before mm-hmm. that movie, I'd been living in Paris for a while. I, I was with a French girl and loving my life. It was incredible. Um, but I was sort of, my career was on, I was very distracted by all the art galleries and the fantastic nature of Paris. Um, and her, of course. And I was like, man, I've really got to get back to myself. And someone had mentioned The Artist's Way. I don't know if you're familiar oh, with yeah, this I've book. Got, I've got that copy Says to get up every morning and write for ninety minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and then each week you've got these different uh, activities, and you take yourself on an artist date where you do something that is meaningful to you or inspiring somehow. And 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 a lot of the exercises in the book were really examining whose ideas and and um, commentary on you are still playing out in your own mind. You know what limiting beliefs are actually just inherited from somebody that's past comment or yeah. judgment on you and that you've sort of taken to heart and it can obviously be your parents or school teachers mates the church society as a whole you know whatever the collective consciousness thinks is right you know and you you kind of take on these I- ideas as truths but they're not they're just what someone else said mm. um or, or believed for their own subjective reasons but th- and that book was really helpful in just sort of examining that it was almost like a form of self-therapy and then realizing like that is utter bullshit what i'm carrying in my head that's not what i believe about myself you know and that was a really instrumental moment i think in my life and my career too where i i felt very unshackled by ideas that weren't really mine yeah yeah that's interesting yeah that's really interesting. i love it i love that book I yeah yeah do I just, you? oh i love it I, and I think it's fascinating. The genesis of the book, you know, it was a woman, Julia Cameron. She was married to Martin Scorsese, who was a genius filmmaker. And, and in order to accomplish his genius results, a lot of energy had to be poured into him. And, and Julia, who was a, a talent in her own right, she was a writer and a screenwriter and a poet, 
uh, her career kind of fell by the wayside. And that book actually came about from her after divorcing Martin Scorsese. She had to she had to reinvent herself and she had writer's block. She didn't believe in herself anymore. So a lot of the exercises in there were things that she developed for herself to kind of get back to her true self as an artist and, and reclaim her talent. And so it has a very mm. deep personal genesis to it that I found really compelling. And yeah, I, I tell a lot of young actors or artists or kids that are sort of starting out and I'm like, just do that do that book i really believe in it <laughs> i've literally got a copy of it out there I've, I've i think i bought it on the recommendation of someone flick for it and never stuck to it but i'm gonna get back to it well it's challenging because it, yeah. it requires a discipline and I, a lot of homework i think i might have had a one or two false starts yeah you know and there's always some excuse that you got to do something but um yeah when i finally committed to doing it and you write a little contract at the beginning you know sort of saying that i will uphold this commitment and and do it and 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 make it a priority and uh, I, I found it was hugely mm. beneficial. Yeah. Okay, so you're, you're from the North Shore of Auckland, like born and raised, did all your education there. Um, there was something I read about you. So you, your parents, Ian and, Ian and Veronica, um, yep. they, they broke up when you were five. And yeah. I'm, I'm intrigued about that because um, you're 49, I'm 50. My parents had a separation when I was about eight. and I, I'm sorry. Oh, I, I mean, I'm I dealing with it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not fun. <laughs> no, they got back together, and actually, that was the worst oh, thing. Oh, well, anyway. okay. Oh, yeah, that, but, that would have been terrible, I know. But it was interesting so, at, the t at the time, because um, I remember the the only other kid in my class at school in Palmer's North was my mate Craig, and his parents had broken up. And So my experience of like us being from a split home was seeing Craig getting presents every Friday and Saturday with his dad. So I was quite excited by it. What was your experience? What do you remember being five and your parents breaking up? I think I had the opposite experience to you and that it, it was it was hugely traumatic for me, I think, because at that age, five, you know, you haven't developed any form of an identity outside of the family unit. It, it, you know, my mum, my dad, my sister, the family cat, Sammy, which my dog was actually named after, um, it was, was my everything, you know, and our little backyard and I just started primary school and walking to Carrie Lands Primary School in, in Titarangi and everything about the the insular nature of that family was was my world and everything outside of that world was was exciting but it was the unknown which can be terrifying and I think when the when my family imploded and it was quite um, I mean there, and there was a lot of arguing between my parents mm. you know it was a horrible lead up to the actual split uh, which was equally traumatic to, to witness your parents sort of spewing that kind of hatred back yeah. at each other and overhearing things that, that you just shouldn't because your your sense of security is so rattled that the people that you love and depend on are clearly not enjoying each other you, mm. you start to, well who's looking after me and then when it split, we, we, we then left Titarangi, we moved to the North Shore, and I, uh, you know, I was the new kid at Birkenhead Primary, and I was the opposite. No one in, that I knew had parents that w were divorced, you know? It just wasn't a thing, was it? it not, in the late not, 1970s? <laughs> not much, no. And, you know, we, if, if they did, they'd probably been together longer than my parents had, and by then, you know, maybe the kids had developed some sense of self outside of the family, mm. and they can maybe better equipped to deal with it. Uh, even my sister, who was two years older, she she did better than me, I think, with handling it. But I, yeah, I, I just really struggled and I felt a huge sense of shame because I felt, what's wrong with me? What's, you know, and... and what, like, am I not enough or something? Yeah, why not? yeah, or just my family, if they're, my family's not together, what's wrong with us? Right. Like, we're, the family's broken and sort of thinking, well, then I must be broken somehow and... And I didn't see any evidence that it was normal. It was so abnormal. I yeah. felt like an outsider. And so I nursed a lot of that really quietly. Um, yeah, I, I just sort of silently struggled with all those feelings and, and harbored this deep hope that my parents would get back to, together. And I think for a couple of years, I felt like I was brokering the peace. And, if, you know, <laughs> if I could somehow, you know, convince them, you know, and, and obviously it was all futile, um, and quite heartbreaking. Um, yeah, that's a lot. To so think. that was, yeah, that was... I was thinking about it, like five, six, seven. Yeah, it was. Was It mm. was a lot to to take on. And and I don't know, you know, I think 
I've obviously examined it a lot over the years in therapy. And um, one thing, though, I've, I've come to find it to be true is often the thing that's the most the most challenging or the, the darkest also within that is the opportunity for the most light, mm -hmm. meaning that it's in those things that we're, we're called upon to find out uh, our deeper selves and our, our self-reliance, you know. And so I think at quite a young age, uh, for me, nature was a huge sense of solace. You know, I, I spent a lot of time on my own in nature and in the New Zealand bush and, and establishing a really profound relationship with the natural world because it, it was a safe place for me and a, and a truly inspiring place. Mm. I derived a lot of joy and, and I, I saw a lot of mysticism of creation within nature and it, it sort of spoke to me of something much bigger than all of us and mm. so in a way as uh, yeah i was forced through the hardship of that to also develop sides of myself at a really young age that i probably wouldn't never have been inclined to do if if i didn't have that yeah it's a lot i feel like for, for kids going through that now there's like a lot better tools and a lot better resources and things like that but back then it's like your parents didn't know what the fuck they were doing either no no Isn't and they didn't even t i mean we didn't know that was the thing you know i, I we we weren't even we weren't consulted, let alone really briefed on the matter. Mm. It just sort of happened, and so as a child, you're you're just in the slipstream of this chaos, mm. kind of trying to make sense of it all and having to accept mm. what's happening um, with with very a huge amount of powerlessness, you know. Whereas I think now there's a lot of research on on people like me uh, <laughs> ex showing that you know it's important to to really talk to the children and, and nurture them through that and support them in a way that uh, they, they require. So I think, you know, we've come a long way yeah. since then. And, and they're all good now? You, you mentioned your dad earlier in the conversation. Yeah. They're, they're, they're both married other people? Yeah, 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 yeah. They're both. In fact, my dad's celebrating his 40th wedding anniversary in two weeks. So we're going down to Raglan to, cool. to celebrate that. Yeah, which is where he got married yeah, back yeah. then in 1980 or whatever it was. Yeah. 80, Jeez, they, they must they must be proud of proud of you not not in terms of an acting perspective in your successful career but just of um yeah the man you are yeah i think so um we're not really a family that talk openly about that <laughs> though <laughs> no it's mine no it's funny i mean i, I but do you tell each other you, you love each other often? oh yeah, yeah yeah we do but we don't sort of my, my dad told me he was proud of me once um yeah, when, when was I, that? The Britney video? <laughs> I think it was around that time, but I don't. I don't think that was the reason. No, no, no. <laughs> um, yeah, no, we're just yeah, just not that kind of overtly. Yeah, so you, you tell each other you love each other, but you just don't show a lot of like vulnerability or. No, not a huge amount. Yeah. No, maybe it's a generation, an era I th thing, or I think it's generational. Know. Yeah. Uh, my my mum more so, um, although she, I think my mum gets so overwhelmed with with her feelings. If things are really triggering for her, and she feels vulnerable, and you know, she mm. sort of really tries, you know, to, to not cry, which is quite sweet. And yeah. She can't help herself, and it all sort of comes, oh. yeah, <laughs> please, yeah, yeah. Um, and then, so when you're like twelve or thirteen, um, that's when there's a casting call at your school for a, a TV show called Strangers. Oh, there I am, Look at that cute little kid. <laughs> Look at that kid. <laughs> Oh, Jeez. so happy! So, did you yeah. you you wanted to do acting before then? What was your? I read somewhere that you saw um, a couple of movies, like a Harrison Ford movie, which I'm guessing was um, Raiders of the Lost Ark or last something. One. Yeah, maybe or a Star Wars, perhaps, or and a Christopher yeah, yeah. Reeve movie as well, which must have been S Superman. Superman, yeah. No, I watched all those growing yeah. up. My no. dad would take us, yeah, S Superman, Star Wars. Um, I think I was always enamored with with movies and and going into the theater and being taken on this journey and and the story and and i, I don't know if it's so much the escapism of it or just just relishing the world and i love the score swelling and mm. especially back then you know like the civic actually i walked past the civic theater the other day with a friend of mine and i was just remembering how much reverence i had for that with the stars on the ceiling and yeah. i had a very very romantic notion of of film and and I think, yeah, I, I, th I thought it would be fun. Um, but it's a really hard thing when back then too, you know, there, <laughs> there was no Russell Crowe. I mean, Sam Neill hadn't done Jurassic Park yet. So there was sort of, the, it, it was such a world away 
that the dream of, of being an actor just felt like it belonged to other people in another in another part of the world. Um, well, the world the world was so disconnected back then. Like, uh, yeah, Los Angeles may as well have been the moon. <laughs> yeah, <it was laughs> you know, I like it was similar age to you. All I ever wanted growing up was um, some of those sea monkeys that were advertised on oh, the back yeah. of comics. Oh everywhere. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you couldn't buy stuff online. No, no. Yeah, we yeah. were so far away. Yeah. Yeah, so totally. then, so then, so, so strangers, so there's a casting call at your school or something? Uh, yes, yeah, so I had done a school play at the end of Standard 4, which is now grade 6, I think, whatever they call it, year 6. Um, the end of primary school, a mate of mine's dad had written an adaptation of Cinderella, and it was sort of a musical with, with punks in it. Uh, it was really awesome, and... Uh, We'd put it on as a school play, and I just I thought that'd be so fun. I put my hand up, so that was my first acting job. Um, and then I started writing s the speeches. I really liked being on stage. I liked I liked the idea of conveying uh, important things. I felt like there was something really great, and I so I'd write speeches about animal cruelty you know and and animal rights and stuff but with humor and i really like the idea that you could stand in front of people and hold their attention and and make them laugh but maybe maybe make them feel something or think about something important so that was all i thought that was cool uh and then at the end of uh, form two at intermediate school tv and Z were going around all the the schools in auckland asking schools to submit four or five kids that would be right for these roles and my mate actually was going. I was going to play uh, football, uh, American football. We were playing gridiron. And my mate, who plays every day, was going the other way. And I said, Michael, I said, Mama, where are you going? And he said, oh, I'm going to the library. I'm like, why are you going to the library at lunchtime? <laughs> he said, oh, they're auditioning for a TV show for TV and Z. And I was like, no way, I want to go. So I went along with him. And still today, he gives me a bit of beef because I got the, <laughs> I got the butt. And he... Yeah, and he didn't. But he was he was a really good skateboarder, and my character in that show, Strangers, was supposed to be a skateboarder, and I couldn't skate. So I got him a job as, uh, as my skate double. Stunt double. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, look, you, look, you hooked him up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He's doing fine. He, I don't think he matters anymore, but it is quite funny. Yeah, he... Yeah. He's so anyway, so that's he's forgiven you, but every every time he um go, goes on Netflix and Virgin, he's like, it could have been me. It should have been me. <laughs> <laughs> that was my destiny. <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah, then you get a Westlake, and um I, I believe you play rugby, and you're quite a good flanker. I was all right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I was really fit. I think I was. I just I started doing a lot of athletics when I was young. I was quite a good long distance runner. So a lot of cross cross country, fifteen hundred meters, eight hundred meters. Um, yeah, and I just did a lot. I just play. I just love being outside. So I grew up. Um, I was fortunate. You know, I I just did a lot of sport, uh, anything I could. So when I got to play rugby, I think I was just super fit. So I could just go and get it to the breakdown pretty mm. pretty quick for the whole game. You know, I didn't need much of a. So I think that was my superpower. Did you have have a, like a no face roll? Like guys, no knees in the face. No, no. no I took face. I took some <laughs> knees, man. I broke my nose a couple of times. Um, <laughs> I'd get blood noses almost every game because, yeah, some of those boys were pretty big. But, you know, it was weight restricted at high school, yeah, so it yeah, was same, never yeah. – yeah, yeah. And then, um, so uh, 1992, uh, you're 17, Shortland Street comes along. Yeah. Um, Shortland Street's still, still going now, but it's um, – uh, yeah, the landscape of free to -air TV has, has changed so much that it doesn't have the sort of like – Cultural relevance. Yeah, or the reach that, right, that it does right. now. But back then uh, – what are your recollections of that time? I'm guessing you were like propelled to like nationwide stardom almost immediately. Yeah, I have very mixed memories of that time because it was hugely exciting to, you know, this was the first time New Zealand had ever attempted to produce anything like this. You know, we'd had neighbours, we'd had Home and Away and of course there was Coronation Street and these sort of his things. sons and daughters so, yeah 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 but new zealand had never attempted to do it and so when i got cast and it was a big deal because i got cast at the end of my sixth form year and I, I uh so i had to decide whether i was gonna um do this or not uh, and miss a year of school um and the intention was to do one year save some money and then i'd go and continue my school at university and put myself through university and um so it seemed like a good one-year plan 
And then when, when we started, we were so terrible. I mean, you look at those early, the makeup's horrific. The hairstyles, bad. I mean, everything's bad. The, you know, the scripts weren't great. The acting was worse. Um, <laughs> Actually, I, I did want to... It was just, pretty bad. I'll just pause you there because I, I wanted to ask you about that because you, you watch it now and it does look, it looks pretty clumsy and pretty bad. But was was it good at the time? And it's just now that the, the lighting's got better and the... You, you, do you know what I mean? Was it good for the time? Or was it still shit at the time? I, for my, I, I haven't actually admittedly watched any of it since it came to air, but my memory of it was those first six months particularly, we were all scrambling to learn our jobs because no, mm. no one had done it before. Um, and it was a huge demand. I mean, you're, you're shooting so quickly, so you've you got to know your stuff as an actor and get in there, do scene after scene after scene. Very little break, very few attempts it takes, you know, if something goes wrong. So you've got to be on your game in a way that I think caught me by surprise. And I think most of us, but we just, we just were committed to it and it got better and it got a little bit better. And then before you knew it, it, it was decent. And I think we all learned our jobs really quickly. And, and it was the first time New Zealanders got to see, what is it, seven o'clock every night every weekday mm. saw themselves reflected in the characters, you know, it was New Zealand accents and New Zealand locations, social and political and cultural issues that were very unique to New Zealand. And I think that was a huge part why people were so enamored with it is because it was like watching ourselves. And, but then with that, of course, came this massive uh, popularity and, and success and visibility and, you know, New Zealand's a small place. I mean, Auckland's a small place. Um, yeah. And as a young, what is I, 17-year-old, I think having that level of attention I found really difficult. And I didn't I – mean, the first few months, I loved it. I thought it was kind of yeah, cool. Intoxicating initially. Yeah, it was sort of like, oh, oh, yeah, you, you know, and very easy to meet girls and all that. So it felt like it was great, but it very quickly – became something that I just was not comfortable with. Cause I realized I like, I love living my life with a sense of freedom. I've always felt that. And when you're that sort of much in a goldfish where you're the one that's being viewed and, and, and looked at, you, you start to feel quite constricted and restricted. And I, and I hated it. I didn't like going out. I didn't like people looking at me while I ate my meal. I didn't like sitting at the traffic and people looking at me in my car. I was just like, oh my God. So I started riding a motorbike. So I just wore a helmet and I felt, <laughs> you know, I just, I really, I really rebelled against the, that side of it. And yeah, it wasn't fun. Yeah. But you, yeah, did you have people like just yelling out, um, Stuart, your character's name? Oh yeah. Ma Martin. Yeah, yeah. 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 And I like to go out, you know, yeah. I, I was young and I, I, I loved going out. And so most of the, people I, I would see out were, were, were probably half drunk and you know it was just a lot it was just a lot of energy that came yeah. your way everywhere you went it was just and it was a, it was I found it was too much to have to be constantly then putting out too you know I kind of mm. in, in some ways I'm quite an introvert um, I get tired from sort of having to your social battery yeah, yeah I kind of yeah I get really uh, wound down yeah yeah and w was the um, was the money okay at the time? Do you remember how much you were getting paid straight out of school? I don't remember the figures, but it was really good for a seventeen year old kid that yeah. was sort of finishing high school. Yeah. So your, your parents okay with that? Like, obviously, you're a smart kid. Like, you had aspirations to go to university and get a like a business degree or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Were they were they like okay, you can do this for a year, sort of thing? Was that the? I think so. That was yeah. That was the original plan, and it made a lot of sense. And. I had a really good six form year, so I, I got into university early. I could have I could have actually gone in my last year of high school, but that wasn't appealing because all my mates were, were still at high school. And I didn't like the idea of going there on my own. So it made sense to do a year, save some money. It's really good money for that age. And then I would, yeah, I'd start university with all my mates, you know, and have a good time and get back to, to real life. But I think it was during that because before then I'd always had this dream or maybe fantasy of being an actor. And I remember being like maybe oh, eight years old and someone had given me, I'd, I got a, um, a poster of Porsches, you know, and it had all the Porsches models at that time in the sort of early eighties. And I put it on my wall and I'd go to bed. And I, I remember even then before I'd even acted like, Oh, one day I'd love to go to Hollywood and 
like a Porsche, you know, which I never, I never, I never got the Porsche, by the way. But I, it was just this young kind of fantasy thing, you know. Yeah, that's what success looks like. Yeah, it, when when I was that age, it did. And um, but I think when doing it every day, and then and I started. Well, first of all, I wanted to get good at it. I wasn't happy enough with my performance, and I would. I would go and I would ask the editors to give me the reels of all of the footage of the previous day's stuff. And between my breaks of filming, I would just watch and watch and I would, I would watch to see where I felt like I was doing a good job and where I felt like I was falling short and, and I would analyze it and I pretty, I'd start to go, okay, that's good, that's not good. And so I sort of self-educated myself and I just had this drive. I wanted to be better. I didn't think what I was doing was good enough. Wow, and and that and that then fueled this this. That's when I started thinking about it. I was like, okay, I think I could do this, and then I won an award, and I think that was definitely the moment. Um, it was the New Zealand Film and Television Awards at the end of that year, and I was shocked. I was shocked. I was nominated. I thought they'd made a mistake, and then I was in the final three, which felt a huge triumph. And then to win, it was just this overwhelming sense of. I think it was. Oh, I can. I can do this. Someone, I'm on the right track. Someone else said I, I'm doing a good enough job. So therefore, my dreams, they don't have to be dreams anymore. This is this is real. And it was from that moment that I just went, okay, I think this is what I'm going to do. And I just quite started to forget, forget about yeah. the idea of a different career. That's a, that's amazing. That thing that you said before about going through the. the I, I had um Andrew Webster, who's the coach of the NRL team, the Warriors, sitting yeah. in that chair the other day. And he introduced a, he's only been the Warriors coach for the past year and he introduced a thing called extreme ownership, which is a like a Navy SEALs SAS sort of thing. And it's he said in the past, um, You the kill co- anyone, it's in your way. <laughs> yeah, that's basically that's one thing right. Okay. <laughs> but in the past the, the coaches have like isolated video clips of all the players and then given them like a you know, a, a video file to watch. But he said extreme ownership is the players going through the video files themselves and then working out what they need to work on. Interesting. Which sounds yeah. like you didn't have a label, but that's exactly what you were doing back in Shortland Street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is it remarkable. Did. Just a, well, just made a, a sense. quest for self-improvement. Yeah, and I thought the only way I can get better is to sort of uh, objectively look at it and say, okay, well, I, I you know, and I'd, I'd grown up watching a lot of TV, man. I, I was a TV addict. I would get up on a Sunday if my parents were sleeping in. I, you know, I'd go in there and try to wake them up, and then roll. I'm like, ah. So I'd go and I'd turn on the TV. I would watch the test pattern. Remember the test? <laughs> I yeah, seriously yeah. would. I would watch. I would just look at the lines and the colors and the and the crisscross and, you know, I, I mean, I just love TV. And then, to the man of born would come on and, and praise be on a Sunday at a dog show. I just consumed everything that was on the tv all of it british stuff american stuff comedy dramas you know and i so i i think i'd grown up watching so much that i i think i was a pretty good judge then i when i watched myself and i'd be like yeah i don't really believe myself in that moment that didn't really work you know um so it was probably just an extension of this mm. of this sort of little addiction i had as a kid that mm. i just i watched films my, my granddad he was a you know, he was in World War Two, and he flew in Lancaster bombers, and we would watch the Battle of Britain and um, the Bouncing Bomb movie, and I mean, just all sorts of the Maltese Falcon and Bridge Over the River Kwai. Just watched a lot of World War Two. He'd never talk about the war, but we would watch war films together, and um, and of course all the blockbusters. And so yeah, I had a voracious appetite for for watching stuff mm. as a kid. So how long did you stay on Shortland Street? Was it two years? Three, two, three years. I think it was it was sh- maybe a month or two shy of the th- of three. Right. Yeah, something and like that. Why did you decide to leave at that? Was it your point to leave? Was it your decision to leave? Yeah, 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 yeah. Why you just itchy feet? I just had enough. I think I'd had enough. Um, I would just put everything I could into that uh, at that age, and also the other st- the, the the public stuff. Like I said, like that, I found that really mm. demanding and draining, and I and I got sick of it. Um, would have been so easy to stay though, way, eh? like golden handcuffs in a way. You know, the security, you've got an acting job, you're doing what you love, you're getting paid good money, just the security of it. Yeah. That would have, that would have been the path of least resistance. Yeah, but I I just had enough of it. I just, mm. I think it was mainly the the fame part of it. I just, I just got bored with it. I, and and it, just, it just, I don't know, it wasn't fun anymore. 
um, I didn't want to be on, on that show and be so front and center and so well known. And um, it started to deplete my joy for the acting. And then, and when I first left Shorten Street, I was like, all right, that's it. I'm done. I'm going to, I didn't know what I was going to do for a moment there. I mean, I love sailing. I'd grown up sailing and I was like, oh, I'm going to work on sailboats. And I sort of started researching how I might start getting into that industry. And then my agent called me and said, look, I know you don't want to do any acting, but uh, there's the show <laughs> in, in Australia uh, called Echo Point that they're being, that's being produced. And I've spoken to the producers about you. And if you're interested, they'd love to meet you and blah, blah. So... So I was like, oh, okay, and I got, you know, I was, yeah, I was twenty, and it meant leaving New Zealand and moving to Sydney, which was sort of really exciting at that age. Uh, and so then that that was what then sent me to Australia and and kept doing it. And mm. so you did it, yeah. Echo Point, Home and Away, a show called Sweat. Was Sweat the one? And oh, I saw some of some of that on YouTube the other day. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, not a great. I don't think it was a great, great show. No, I don't think I don't think is that, is that point where was very you, good either. You're like a it's like a you're in a, like a swim squad or something. Yeah, it was a bunch of sort of young adults that were vying for their Olympian, you know, sh shot and slot in the Olympic team. So it was about a a sports academy that was training right. these 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 talented potentials and and the interpersonal relationships and the politics and the setbacks and you know who had the whatever it, it wasn't very good i'm probably making it sound better than it really was <laughs> that's also on youtube it's like that it felt like a step down from shortland street in a way but i, I don't it, know i don't what the fuck do i know yeah and i i was i actually took that job because my girlfriend at the time uh i started dating someone who was working in when i went to sydney to work on echo point i started dating a woman that worked in the production uh, office and then and she was from Perth and she said to me oh I'm going to Perth to do the show blah blah you should look into it and I was like oh well and I thought oh it's a way for us to stay together for a little bit and um, so that's actually that was my algebra for why I, I, I took that job but yeah that's where I met Heath Ledger he was you know, a Perth resident he was 16 and um, we became good buds and you know yeah. was a lot of good things came out of that yeah yeah what are your re recollections of that of like like meeting heath for the first time did you guys just like sort of bond and blow yeah, down we, straight away yeah we did the first time i met him he walked into the room he was late it was the cast read through and he walked in the door and i instantly knew the guy was going to be a star he hadn't even opened his mouth he hadn't i hadn't heard him read a line of dialogue or anything it was just what he carried as, as as a well he was a kid he was 16 um just this presence and this charisma that he that he had and i was like wow that guy is gonna be somebody mm. yeah. and so, so you were you a more a seasoned actor than he was at that stage with your three years of shortland street yeah was that his first job yeah well no he i think he'd done one other little job maybe a year prior i think it was his second job but yeah um yeah, I guess I was like the older, wise and experienced <laughs> this is what seasoned I veteran. This <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I never gave him acting yeah, tips. Yeah. I never gave him acting tips. And and you you guys um you were you were flatmates? We was yeah, eventually yeah. Show? No, yeah. when that show ended, I moved back to Sydney and I called him up and I just said, Mate, you you're you're gonna do so well. Trust me on this, just come to Sydney. You need to you know, you need to get out of Perth, you need to be Kind of where the where the big market is and and um and he did him and his best mate jumped in a car and they drove across australia and they arrived in sydney and uh, and then we yeah we got a house in bondi with another kiwi mate of mine and and madness ensued <laughs> yeah is there oh any boy. any tales you of madness no <laughs> no, you, no, been, no you've been um i, I can't I, remember them that well i, I don't know if this is still <laughs> still accurate or if you drink now at all but you you've been sober since 27 uh 27 years old 27, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah 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 so, so these that? were some loose years oh yeah yeah, yeah they were <laughs> everything bond they were the year, they were the years that, that made me realize i probably need to get sober right is that so mm -hmm. yeah no they were fun mm -hmm. um <laughs> They were definitely fun, but they were they were good messy. Mem good, good memories to look look back on now from the perspective of a, a middle aged man of an older dude. Yeah, I mean, look, it, it's I think it's a, a rite of passage. Mm. You know, you're you're away from home. You're young. We were working. We were earning good money. We were 
having fun, which is the only thing you were seriously interested in outside of work was mm. just how can you have the most fun? And, and Sydney's a very fun town. Um, you know, it was awesome. I mean, in your early 20s and flatting with, with good mates and mm. doing work you love and, uh, yeah, just it was great down at Bondi and, um, <laughs> yeah, but it was un, un, uh, uh, untenable. It could, could, <laughs> yeah, yeah, could yeah, keep yeah. going on it's forever. It's a time. A moment, a moment in time. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, yeah. But, you, but you, you guys were, like, really good mates, right? Like, you, you went to Prague to, to hang out with him when he was filming A Knight's Tale? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. over there. Well, my girlfriend was in the movie too. Right. So, um, yeah. So, yeah, it was weird. Our lives were just sort of always quite in, entwined. And uh, I stayed at his house in LA. He bought a really lovely house after he did The Patriot, I think it was. Um, and he was traveling so much because, you know, and then he was working on different stuff. So, and I was, I was still sort of quite new to LA at that point and just sort of trying to, start my own career over there and um so yeah but there were a lot of people that stayed in that house it was kind of like a flop house for wannabe australian new zealand actors that were coming through oh, town really like hemsworths or is this pre hemsworths i think it was pre hemsworth they hadn't even sort of arrived on the scene but um every everybody everybody else yeah at that time in the sort of the early early 2000s yeah yeah, that's amazing. And and what about um, um news of his death? Like, we, we, do you remember where you were, what you were doing? Yeah, yeah. No, I remember it very, what, very what, well. What did he die of? It was like just some a, a cocktail of like pharmaceuticals, like sleeping pills, and yeah, accidental, I mean, right? I, I, hundred yeah, percent accidental. Yeah. yeah, no, the man had so much to live for. Um, his daughter, his daughter, just one giant thing. I think that alone, um, he would never ever have mm. chosen um, to not be around. Uh, for her um, but also his work you know the he was ex- oh the, the joker was exceptional oh yeah and he said to me i remember we spoke on the phone he was in london he said marty i, th- I think i finally figured out the acting thing I, fi- I this is i finally figured out how to do it you know and until that point he really didn't believe that he knew what he was doing he was just trying to figure it out and clearly when he he created that role he it was just such Mm. beautiful profound work you know scary yeah. good and scary in that it was so dark you know what he allowed himself to access you know um and have the courage to to live in that own part of his psyche um was phenomenal uh you know he's a true artist and yeah he was an inspiration even before that he was an inspiration to me even though he was younger than me he was such a beautiful friend he was so generous you know and and so passionate and uh yeah it's he's do you, rem- do you remember your last conversation i do i do um yep and we were yeah we were getting closer and closer and that's why it was really sad you know i i um our friendship was actually starting to really build again because uh, when i got sober i kind of distanced myself from a lot of people in that scene because they, they were definitely not sober uh, <laughs> you just sort of have to don't you you have to oh, like shed your old friend group for a while yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. too much temptation uh, too, and just yeah you can't do yeah. two things at once so um but yeah it'll be it's it was a real real big loss you know personally but just for the world that he would have gone on to do i believe so much more incredible work you know mm. not not just as an actor but i think as a director too you know, he, he was just dipping his toe into that and he had a script that he was really passionate that he was developing that he wanted to direct. And um, he was an amazing photographer and just, yeah. Well, it was just going from strength to strength. Hey? Even the, the, I suppose, the cute movies early on, like Two Hands or A Knight's Tale, they're just great. And Ten Things I Hate About Ten You. Ten Things I Hate About You, yeah. Just great, just great movies. And yeah. Brokeback Mountain, just phenomenal. Yeah, brilliant. Incredible. Yeah, yeah you actually, um, so this is after uh, Heath's de- death, you worked um, on a movie called Everest with Jake Gyllenhaal. Did you guys sort of? Did you know Jake before that? Do you do you bond with him over your m- mutual connection with Heath? Um, no, not really. No, no, um, no. Jake, Jake, he sort of came into that movie for a very short time. You know, he yeah. works a lot. I think it was one of those things where his agent managed to get him. He finished one movie and then he 
slipped in to shoot most of that stuff was i think up in the mountains right um so he wasn't really around as much as the entire cast and i think he was getting ready to do southpaw because i remember he was training yeah, and we yeah. spent some time actually in italy we were up at this um in the dolomite mountains and it was you know very high up and he was getting ready to train and i was like oh, i'll train with you and and he had a whole little routine that we were doing, but it was really hard because there was no oxygen. And, you know, it's really, really hard to work out at that, at that <laughs> oh, altitude. The altitude. Oh, it was, yeah, yeah, it was brutal. Okay. Yeah. And the two of us, we didn't even get through it. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think he was going off to shoot that movie. So didn't see, didn't spend that much time with them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah, I suppose you have this perception as like a movie watcher that, oh, they must be like broing out on the mountain. or Yeah. yeah. No, some other people, though. That was a beautiful yeah. experience. Um, Jason Clark, who... Yeah, it was an Aussie actor who actually my very first film role was in a film in Sydney right before I left Australia to go to the States and Jason played the sort of the nasty mean guy. Um, and I just, I, but I just remember him being on set and I was such a fan of his, I watched him work and he just had this kind of this Brando-esque quality to him. I remember as a really young actor just going, that guy's going to do great. And you know, and he, he's, done amazing so that was a real joy to be back with him years later mm. and we did a lot of our training for that movie we went to ben nevis in scotland and climbed that uh yeah. but we also went down to the uh the tasman glacier here and stayed in a hut on the glacier and did some climbing and different training here in new zealand which was cool and mm. yeah how good and then th so then um after your um stint in this how many years in australia how many years were you in australia doing the the soaps and whatnot I think it was three years total, yeah. yeah. And then you decide to make life really difficult for yourself and you go to New York to become like a s struggling student. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah you're was, right. I, do, I am taking the, 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 the hard road, aren't yeah, I? It's like when things Man. start to get good, you're like, nah, this is too easy. Yeah, yeah cause it, I, I, from what I've read about your time <laughs> in New York, a two-year two two year course studying like the fundamentals of acting, it sounds grim, like you're sleeping on a, sleeping on a floor on a tiny mattress, uh, your bartending job at a like a swingers club or a strip club or a, <laughs> yeah, a, yeah. an orgy club or something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, it was definitely a challenging time again. Um, <laughs> yeah, like Your parents along the way must have been like, Martin, what what's the fuck he doing? are you doing? <laughs> You're self-sabotaging. Yeah. I, I, when, you, when you say it like that, <laughs> I guess in hindsight it sounds like, but in the moment, you know, I had... I had started acting really young. I, I kind of fell into it because it was something I just enjoyed doing. So any opportunity, I'd put my hand up. It created opportunities. And then from those opportunities, I was able to build on it. But I had never really studied acting. Like I said, I'd studied myself. I'd self-taught. Mm. Um, and a lot of the people that I was working with had just come out of drama school, like NIDA in Australia or, or here in New Zealand. And, and, I, and I felt like there was some part of my training that i was missing and um and i wasn't really i mean i was successful in that i kept getting work but i didn't feel like sweat and echo point and a lot of the jobs i was doing were i didn't feel like i was doing work that i was that proud of um so i wanted to i wanted to work on stuff that i felt would challenge me in a way and i could see what i was made of and i decided that studying theater would be the best way to do that because arguably the best writing is in a play you know a playwright goes away and toils and sweats over that stuff for years sometimes um and you really can only be as good as the writing and so i i wanted to immerse myself in a in a in a situation where that was the stuff that was fueling my ideas of acting um so i was like well where would you do that i guess london or new york and i was like well i don't love new york uh, london as much as i love new york so i'll go there um and then as soon as i made that decision i met uh my acting teacher in sydney uh annie swan um and she yeah just through a coincidence I, I met this person and i started going to her her house for acting classes and um and she really set me up for sort of leaving this part of the world and and opening up my ideas and um, and she educated me on art and music and literature and plays and films and stuff that, you know, as a suburban kid from the North Shore of Auckland, I hadn't really come across, you know, and, and I started getting this appetite for 
for other artists and and excellence and and what is excellence and and developing some taste and kind of refining my own sense of what I want to do with my life you know not just my work but my life and she was hugely instrumental in um, making me grow up and get a get an education and and so my idea of going to New York it it, it wasn't to make it hard uh, it was to <laughs> I guess find out what I was made of and and find out what I what I needed to learn to be to be better um, so and it was really really hard I had I known it was going to be as hard as it was because of course then the New Zealand dollar was 36 oh uh, yeah 36 um, oh, cents, cents in the you dollar get, yeah, so, yeah you so get it so, so it was brutal three New Zealand dollars to one to green do yeah yeah oh. yeah so just that you know and I was like oh okay I've got to go to work here just to pay my rent and as you know New York's so expensive and were you, were you just chipping into savings you had some savings from I, I had some savings yeah um but the extra, I, yeah, I just, I hadn't really budgeted as well as I could. <laughs> and I'd gone to Europe the summer before with some mates and toured around on a van and I bought this van and it blew up in Spain and <laughs> caught on fire. And so I was like, oh man, okay, the, the money's going down. I'm going to school. Um, but yeah, whatever. I just, but you do what you do. You get your hustle, right? And that was cool. I hadn't been in that position before either. Um, from a very early age, I'd always had a pretty healthy paycheck. Mm. And now I was working, yeah, two two jobs, uh, you know, double shifts on weekends, restaurants, bars, whatever it was, um, to just make ends meet. And even that was kind of cool in a way. It was it was different. It was new, and it was New York City. And so, so, so did you did you kind of like maybe deep down the uh, the concept of being like a struggling artist? Yeah, in a way, I. No, I don't think I wore it as a badge because I, I still wanted to get back to being an artist that did actually <laughs> that did wasn't struggling and got paid for <laughs> it. Yeah, in a beard. yeah. I didn't romanticize it to that extent, but it was just the situation that I was in, um, and I knew I was growing. I was growing by being in that environment with other artists that were also passionate and struggling, and and I loved New York. I loved the architecture, and I loved I loved mm. the diversity and the the energy and and the honesty of the people and um, I just I just thrived in that and I felt anonymous you know I mean I've been in front of the camera for so long I'd been everyone I go places people knew who I was no one knew who I was in New York I was free I could just go there and and be inspired and um, and I really yeah and I formed some great friendships and but I was very quick once yeah I, I to get back on the work train and get out to LA when the pres opportunity presented itself. Yeah, yeah. Because so you were sleeping on like a like a like a camp mattress, like a foam. Oh mate, I slept on yeah, mattress or something. Like it, you didn't even have a bedroom or anything. No. You, when you put your head down on the pillow at night, there must have been nights where you're like, "What the fuck are you doing?" Um, yeah, there were. There definitely were moments. Um, but I knew what I was doing. Mm. I was. I was. Um, but there's no guarantee. Like it's not like okay everything's going to be fine in a couple of years it's it's on a like a hope really isn't it hope that everything's going to be fine yeah but i didn't i didn't all i all i knew was that this was going to make me better better as a man better as a artist you know i i knew it was challenging it was it was forcing me to develop parts of my character that i'd never had before and that felt like a really good thing um because in you never, never go if you never, never go. And I learned that I can struggle, that I can fight, you know, and that I won't roll over and I mm. will do whatever has to be done. So sort of built resilience. Yeah, and I think that's important. And, and it probably did help in, in a way with the, the next period of going to LA and the rejection and, and the struggle there, you know, and the mm. setbacks. and Because um, you've, you've touched that part of yourself that will fight, that won't give up, you know. And you don't take yourself, you're not precious about things and well, you won't take the easy route, mm. you know, because, um, and I, I think intuitively I, I knew that it, it was building those parts of myself and yeah. that was a good thing. That's a lot of wisdom for a young fella, I think. And in hindsight, like from the perspective of a 49 year old man, do you look back and think, fuck, I was, I had my head screwed on the right way. I don't think I would have had the same sort of tenacity at that age. I think if I was in your shoes at that age, 
after a couple of nights in a cockroach infested New York flat, I would have been like, I'm going to call up Shortland Street and see what's up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like there was, yeah. I suppose that's the thing. You did have like a, a plan B back home. Like, you know, some doors would have opened for you, but you'd have to come back with your tail between your legs to a degree. Yeah. Yeah. And I did. And I, 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 I believed in myself, you know, I backed myself and that's, and that's why I was there. Um, I think if I didn't believe in myself, then I would have, I wouldn't have taken that leap. I would have just stayed, you know, I'd just gotten to a film in Australia and that was a big deal back then. You were either a TV actor or a film actor and I managed to get cast in this film and that was, that was huge. Um, and there, there was a moment I was like, oh, what am I doing? <laughs> Things are just starting to, you know, I'm on the right path here. But, um, but I'd re I read a lot about the, the actor's studio and the, the sort of that period of, of, of uh, drama school in New York and the, you know, I was very curious about that world and I wanted, I wanted to be a part of it. It inspired me. You know, I started reading the plays and um, I, I, I just, I don't know, I just found it attractive. Mm. Even if it was hard, it was still, it was still inspiring. It was still, uh, you know, and you're in New York City. I mean, yeah, it's tough <laughs> and you, you, you're sleeping on a foam mattress on the floor and you've got a mate on the sofa and another guy there and one guy's snoring and it's snowing outside and you know, and you're worried about how much money you've got at the end of the week for food, but you're like, well, if I do a double shift, I guess I could get, you know, all my meals at the restaurant that night. And, um, yeah, and it, it's, probably, it's probably worth noting as well, just um, for anyone that's listening or watching to this, like this was a time where... You couldn't just pick up your iPhone and FaceTime your family back home and it cost nothing. Like, No, you had um, the calling cards. You had to yeah. have the calling card, you scratched the code. Yeah, and, uh, yeah or, or a landline and, or, or even letter writing perhaps. Yeah. There were no letters. <laughs> but there were emails, weren't there? This was oh, 2000. Was yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Maybe this this was 1998. This was 98 to 99. Right. So, Got to make yeah. it sound like ye olden days. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but it was, but yeah, it was home, the calling home, cards is how I would Auckland do definitely felt like a long, long way away compared to how it is now, though, I guess. Yeah, 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 yeah. totally, yeah. So then, and then you drop out of that, it's a two-year course, you drop out after one year? I drop out of, after one year um, voluntarily. Um, I, I, I decided I wanted to do some private uh, tutoring, um, some other teachers, just privately. Also because the school took, that was just, just pragmatically i mean f from eight in the morning till four in the afternoon you're at school and then i'd, I'd get on my 10 speed bike and i'd cycle down town to the restaurant um and clock in and then put on the thing and then work there and do a whole shift and then cycle back up to my apartment at night and come in the door and crash out and then wake up to school and i just felt like i i needed to have less time a more focused time of work, of, of my school rather, um, and a lot of the stuff within the school I felt wasn't necessarily that important. Um, so I wanted to do the second year, just do private study with an acting coach, and then I just have more time to have a little more of a relaxed lifestyle. But uh, a producer had seen that movie that I did in Australia just before I left, and it's quite a funny story. It was. I think it was a Tuesday morning. It was winter. I was not sober. I was really hungover. <laughs> and my mates had gone to school and I was like, I could hardly lift my, my head off the pillow. And the school was very strict that you, you would not miss a day of school, even if you were sick, certainly if you were hungover. Um, and they were like, come on, man, you should come. I'm like, no, I can't. Just go. Just tell them I'm really sick. So they go and about, I don't know, I fell back asleep and the phone rings. And I answer, and I, I'm like, oh, hello, my head hurts, you know. And it's, and this guy's like, oh yeah, g'day, Martin. I'm, you know, Lance. I'm a producer in Hollywood. And I saw this movie that you did before you <laughs> left Sydney. And, oh, you're great. And I reckon, you know. And I said, oh fuck off. <laughs> and I thought it was my mates like calling from school. So I hung up on him. And then he rings back again. He's like, why'd you hang up on me? I'm like. Are you for real? And then he's like, yeah, I'm actually a producer. And I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. Um, anyway, and that guy, yeah, Lance Reynolds um, hooked me up, man. He came out to New York and he took me to lunch and he said, hey, look, I just I saw this movie. I think you're really talented. I think you have a, a, a future in Hollywood. And if I can help, I'd, I'd be more than happy to introduce you to people. And 
So then I was like, all right, I'm not going back to school. I think I'm going to go back and do, you know, go back to work. And, and to his word, um, I finished the year and then I flew out to LA and he introduced me to an agency and a manager. And, and then that was sort of the start of being in LA. Yeah, uh, I feel like you were about to say, and the rest is, is history, but it's like you got to LA and things, that, things got even grimmer than New York, right? Like there was, um, yeah, like just, but I, I, I was thinking about this. I suppose this builds even more resilience. Like, um, you know, getting told no is, is hard, but if you hear no over and over again, or you go to auditions and you, you know, don't get the role over and over again, it, again, it builds more resilience, doesn't it? And character in a way. It does. Um, it does. And look, and I, I feel like I was, that's why I say I feel lucky because although I, you know, I got that agent, the, the manager, like straight away. So that part of the puzzle was done. I'm like, okay, now I have an opportunity. People are going to send me out and I have a chance to get in a room and actually, you know, get a job. Excuse me. Um, and I am within that. I remember in a very short period of time, Oh, that's a whole other story. But I, I, I went in an audition for a movie um, that Jason Biggs ended up doing, I think. Um, it was called Loser. It was a Sony film. Oh, you read about the same sort of era as what he was doing American Pie. Yeah, yeah, around yeah. there. Yeah, it would have been, this would have been 99, maybe the, 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 the summer of 99. Um, and I flew back to New York because by then my manager, my, my now, you know, fancy... Amer Hollywood manager and L uh, agent were saying, you've got to be in, in LA. And I'm like, oh no, I'm a, th I'm a, I'm a New York actor, you know? I'm really <laughs> serious. I'm, I'm not like these other people you represent out there. And they're like, <laughs> that, that may be true, but it's going to be a lot harder for us to get you work if you're not here. So I very begrudgingly went back to New York, packed up my little suitcase, got my Mac pack, backpack, and uh and on the and I, when I was in New York, they called and they said, "Hey, remember that audition you did for Loser?" And I'm like, "Yeah." And they, they love you. I'm like, "Oh, cool." I'm like, yeah, they want to screen test you. Um, oh man, I'm not going to go into that. There's a whole story. Right? Oh no, look, oh, mate, listen, I'm, can you edit this because this could go on. I'm for I'm a long I'm fully time, engaged. Bro. But yeah, we're on we're on your clock. But I'm loving these stories. This is a great I mean, deep dive into. Not just into into your your amazing career, but also um, there's some really good lessons in here about like resilience and persistence and hard work, and I love that. Okay, so well, this is probably more akin to a story about not being an idiot, and <laughs> well, not that it was all my fault. So I fly out to LA. Um, Heath's living with his girlfriend in the hills in Laurel Canyon. Uh, he's like, come and stay with me. And my girl. I'm like, oh. So I'm in this spare room. We're like cruising around LA. It was so much fun. He's about to go off and do the Patriot. So he's working out with a trainer on the beach and getting ready for that and learning his American accent. And uh, and during that time, um, I had a rental car. No, he had a rental car. And he said, oh, mate. And I had to get a haircut because I'd been this student in New York. I had no money. My hair was just ridiculous. <laughs> and the manager's like, you got to get a haircut. And I will give you a free haircut. I mean, that's how poor I was. There's, a, there's someone that will cut your hair in West Hollywood tomorrow at 3. And he's like, oh, take my rental car. I'm like, oh, thanks, bro. So I drive down to the hair place. I go and I get my haircut. And while I'm getting my haircut, someone breaks into the car and steals. Remember Filofaxes? Remember Filofax? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I had a Filofax. Like a yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a huge thing with things. Anyway, and I had my passport in it, my New Zealand passport. So I come back from getting my, my haircut and, and it's gone. Don't think it's a big, big deal because I have no plans to really go anywhere. So then I... I do these few auditions and then they're like, you've got to live in LA. So I go back to New York to pack up my stuff to permanently move to LA, much to my hatred. Um, and while I'm in New York, they call me up and they say, Hey, you know, you've got this screen test. I'm like, Oh, it's amazing. Like I'm, I'm in the final two or three guys. And they're like, yeah, it's in um, Toronto tomorrow. <laughs> and I'm like, Oh, <laughs> Oh, shit. Well, about that, uh, I don't have a passport. What do you mean you don't have a passport? So I tell them that story. <laughs> you, got the, you must have seemed chaotic. Oh, oh yeah, I'm sure. Um, yeah. Even that wasn't your fault. But no, it wasn't my, it wasn't my fault. But, but it, so I fly, I fly back early the next morning. My manager picks me up 
in her car, drives me to the New Zealand consulate. She can somehow convinces them to give me a emergency passport, um, which they grant me. So then I get that. I go back to the airport. I fly to Canada. I go to bed. I wake up the next morning. I go to the sound stage. We do the dance. And Zoe Deschanel is one of the girls who's awesome, by the way. Um, really wanted the part. I was so excited. Like, oh my God, it's all happening. It's like, just, just like that. And then we finish the screen tests and then we all go back to the airport to, to fly back to the, to LA. And I, um, but my passport doesn't have my, my visa in it. I don't actually have the means to get back into America oh. because the, the original visa was in the passport that got stolen. So when I get to the immigration, they're like, so where are you? And technically I wasn't supposed to be trying to procure work because I was on a student visa. Mm. And I, so I was in this sort of, very anxious situation and and the studio people from sony were like and the director were like are you okay because they see me getting shuffled away into like the secondary inspection line of the american immigration i'm like yeah i'm, I'm fine <laughs> anyway they give me the third degree and i and i and i said oh no and they said well, what are you doing i said oh it's just summer i'm just visiting friends in la and they're like well where's your visa i'm like well my passport's sold and anyway long i mean it was such an ordeal so they give me a an I-94 form that allows me to be in the country for three months, during which time they said I have to then go to the immigration department and get a new visa. After months of trying, I, I, it turns out you can't get a visa in the country that you want to visit. You have to get the visa from an external consulate. Right. So anyway, right. so I got kicked out of the country again. Uh, then the, ca the Canadians wouldn't take me because they were worried I was going to, uh, scrounge off their social system or something and I said look no offense I don't I, I wouldn't want to live in Canada but and they didn't appreciate that either and so so they so I got I kind of got stuck so they let me go in for the night but they took my passport and I stayed in a in a uh, hostel by a lake somewhere in, in in Vancouver and it happened to be my 25th birthday the next morning and I woke up and I go into the kitchen and there's all these you know Germans and whatnot and and there's a guy that i played soccer with at birkenhead from when i was like eight years old he goes martin henderson and i'm like yeah he's like what are you doing here bro i thought you, <laughs> i thought you were you're you're an actor <laughs> and i'm like well yeah i'm trying i'm trying um anyways a lot and oh, mate, it just went on and on and on i had to go back to new york finally to get a special request to get the visa reinstated but i wasn't supposed to be trying to procure work and um yeah, there were a lot. I just had a lot of things like that happen that were um, chaotic, you know. Yeah, and it, were, you look back now. Was it bad luck, or, or yeah? I mean, was it was it because of your drinking and I the think time, some or? of it. Uh, I, I think some of it was definitely related to the lack of attention I was paying to certain aspects of my life because I was sort of. I don't think I was entirely present as I could have been. Um, I mean, the breaking into the cat, that was sort of bad luck. Um, I mean, there were so many stories like that, mm. though. I mean, that, that <laughs> oh time God. in L.A. was kind of nuts. And then when I finally, so I, I, I long story short, I, I, you know, and you go through the inevitable rejection and then you're like, oh, man, am I, is this really, you know, should I be doing this, you know? But I always had the carrot of the screen test, you know. I was getting so close on important projects so en enough of a sniff to keep you in there that it just felt like well, why would you not i mean yes the rejection sucked and yes it was boring and 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 there were moments where i was like i don't want to do this anymore i don't like this identity you know but i also had these very close calls so i knew it wasn't it wasn't a fantasy you know i was that close and i just i just had to to stay the course and and it's, suck up whatever I had to. It's a gambler's mentality, though, isn't it? It's like one more one more coin on the little, slot machine. Yeah, but I knew I knew, but I did say to, I said I'd give myself five years. I said, look, I'm not going to be because I don't want to be a struggling artist. I'm not. I'm, I don't actually find it that in, that, that interesting. I want to be an artist, but if for some reason I can't do it for reasons outside of my control. Um, then I will, like the accent thing, you know, I, I, I got really close to some big films, but my accent was sort of, it would come and go and it was in and out. And, <laughs> and I got so sick of it. So I was like, right, that is the last time. I will never, I will never be refused from a job because of my accent, because that is in my control, you know? And so I just set to work and I, every day for months, bro, I just got up, 
had my breakfast. I went back to my bedroom. I shut the door and I just drilled and drilled and drilled and drilled these sounds to the point where I could then go out and get a pack of cigarettes from a 7-Eleven and the guy had no idea I wasn't from America. And that was my goal. I was like, I want to remove all of the reasons why someone else is saying no, you know? Mm -hmm. And if I remove all of those and they're still saying no, then okay, maybe, maybe it's a fate thing. Um, but luckily, you know, I, I, I started getting work. Um, I, I did a pilot for ABC um, just to pay the bills because I was so out of money. My mum had lent me some money. I bought the shitty truck that had three cylinders. Uh, Jeez, that's got to be humbling, like having to call home and say, hey, mum. Yeah, it was. That's, that's an admission of defeat in a way. D but no, it wasn't defeat, no. man. No, no, but oh, that was the okay. thing. It was, it was, yeah, my mum, my sweet mum, you know, bless her, she, she said... Absolutely, if, you know, if you, because I said, Mum, I just, I don't know when it's, I can't tell you it's, when it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. So it's refusing defeat. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Def, to ex, yeah, admitting defeat would have been to say, oh, I'm broke, I'm going to go home, you know. And if Mum had said, oh, look, no, or I don't have any money, or sorry, you know, then I would have, I would have found another way. You know, I would have got a job. I would have got a job under the table. I yeah. would have, I would have figured it out. And your, your parents were still in your corner at this point? They weren't like, come on, come back home? I think my dad, yeah, that was around the time that my dad's like, look, I get it, son. I know why you'd want to be there and you'd want to be like Russell Crowe and he's done so well, but... Um, uh, come back to the street. <laughs> yeah, but... Uh, nah, I, no, I, cool. I knew. I think I knew deep down. Mm. Um, and I could, you know, for the first six months or so, I pretty much refused to do TV because I just, I'd done so much of it. I didn't want to, I didn't want to be stuck on a show for nine months of the year where you're just playing the same character potentially for years and years and years. Um, but I eventually, I, I agreed to do a job on a pilot for an ABC TV show um, just to get some money and pay my mum back. Um, what was it? What was the show? Can you remember? It was called The Beast. Um, yeah. It never, it never made it to air, I don't think. Although they did, pick it up and I was lucky I didn't have to go back and do it um, by then I'd gotten a job on Wind Talkers the Nicolas Cage movie so I was in Hawaii filming that yeah yeah and the casting woman who who has been incredible her name's Kelly Lee she's been a huge supporter of mine she put me in numerous jobs uh, over the years and she's like okay fine good for you do do your movie we'll, we'll recast your role you know with another guy um, so I was like, yes, I'm not stuck on a yeah. TV show. <laughs> so so that, that pilot that you did, that show, The Beast, like what, what, what do you earn for a pilot? Oh, Is it enough money that you go, thank God, I'm, I'm, I'm okay for the next few months? Yes, what? yes. It was, I remember it was enough to pay my mum back, which I felt really you know, strongly about. Um, so I paid my mum and then, I, yeah, I had some money to you know, fly to Paris to see my girlfriend and live there for a while and um, buy a cigarettes and drink coffee and <laughs> <laughs> go to museums yeah, and yeah. Um, live, a, live a life again. Um, so it's just sort of like keeps, keeps the wolves away from the door for a little bit longer. Exactly. And then it was like, okay, now I've got a six month visa from that show. Now I've got six months, to, you know, to get the next job. Uh, and that was a big part of what it was about too, because my student visa was about to expire. I was out of money. I owed my mum money. Uh, so it was like, okay, fine. The, get me a TV job. I'll do a pilot. Um, so, but then that job, so I went to, uh, I think Heath might have been shooting The Knight's Tale by then. So, I, and I went to Prague and then I went back to Paris with my girlfriend and then I was like, I had to come back for something in LA, I forget what it was. And, and this was just, this is stupidity. So when I got the pilot, they gave me a, a letter from the studio and a letter from, I think an immigration agent sort of saying that I was, legally allowed to perform these services for, for six months. I could stay in the States. Um, but what I didn't realize is when I left the country, I needed to take that paperwork to a, cons a U.S. consulate and get a visa, a work visa embossed in my passport. But I stupidly got on a plane, really hung over from London. I'd gone out my last night, visited some mates from high school that were flatting there, ran into my stepsister, had a big night um got got on a plane on oh, my my card i'm standing in an atm in soho somewhere 
because I leave the bar and I'm like, oh, I'll get some more money out. I go, I put my card in <laughs> and then I guess it's a scam there, right? Right as the money's comes, the door to the money opens up, I, f I feel this push and next time I'm flying through the air, this guy's side check me. I've gone flying, he's grabbed my money and as I hit the ground, I see him grab my money. So I chase him through the streets of London, finally get him, tackle him to the ground, uh, grab my money. He sh sort of shrugs out of his shirt and runs off shirtless. But the friggin' the card had been left in the machine, right? So the next morning, I get on, I, I, I get to the airport, I get to Heathrow, I buy a packet of cigarettes, have a coffee. I'm so, I'm so hungover. <laughs> I get on the plane, we fly to LA, I land. I'm so dehydrated. I wait in that horrible line. I get to the front. I go, I give him my passport. I hand over my paperwork from Disney Studios and the lawyer. And I go, yeah, you go, I'm here. You know, I've got a visa for the thing. He said, well, where's the visa? I'm like, well, no, that's the paperwork they gave me. Like, yeah, but you've got to have a visa in your passport. Oh. I'm like, oh, come on. And he's like, uh, he said, well, you have two choices. You, we either deport you for not having the right paperwork or you refuse your right to entry. And I'm like, well, of course I'll refuse my right to entry then because if you deport it, it goes on your thing. So then I go down to secondary inspection and they fingerprint me and they question me and all that. I'm like, I'm just, just an actor. I'm not doing anything illegal. And then they put me in a room with a bunch of other people for hours and hours. They give you a little sandwich in a box. And then about, oh, I don't know, late that night, they handcuff me to these other dudes. There was uh, three Brazilian guys and five Chinese guys. They handcuff me. We're chained together. They lead us out. <laughs> they lead it. This is true. They lead us out of the inspection port into a, a baggage carousel to, to identify where our bags have been, you know. And of course, an Air New Zealand flight had just arrived. And I'm, I'm, I'm like, oh I look, yeah, I'm like, oh my God, I'm in. someone's going to go like, that's Stuart from Shoulder Street. Wait, he, wait, he's chained up. I couldn't believe it was happening. And, uh, so he, I, I go, yep, that's my Mac pack there. They, they put it into a van. Uh, they put us in a van. They drive us through the night. They go to downtown, like deep down, down, under the, under the ground into a cell. They put me in a cell with these, the Chinese guys who for some reason think I can speak Chinese, but the whole night they just keep talking to me in Chinese and they clearly wanted me to call a number and there was something written in Chinese. Yeah. I'm like, bro, I, I can't help you. And then the next morning they... They take me back, they give me my bags, they walk me, or they drive me back to the airport, and then I had to get on a flight that I had to pay for to go back to London. Um, and they walk me on the plane, and uh, in handcuffs, walk me on the plane with guys with guns. I'm like, I, I, I look like a, over the top. I look like a serious crim. Like, can you not, can you just take the handcuffs off? Like, what are the people on the plane gonna think? I'm like, well, we don't know you won't run, kid. I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> you've got you've got guns man like what it was hysterical so Jim, then this this is pre 911 right yes this is pre 911 so this, this is, is when they were a little bit more lenient than what yeah, this was now. yeah this was like treating me really nicely <laughs> oh my god now now I'll shoot you on the spot yeah so i had to go back to london and oh. wait for my visa thing and i a, a friend of mine was living there with her new husband and he was a builder. So I just worked building lofts in the north of London for a while until I got the visa. And, um, and how long? How long was a while? I, was, I feel like it was only 10 days. Yeah, right. It was whenever the appointment happened. At yeah. The, yeah. It was cool. So I passed the time there and earned a bit of pocket money and mm. learned to yeah, put build lofts. drywall up <laughs> and stuff like that. Yeah. It? it seems like you've been really good at just not, not um, – Sitting still, or or like brooding, or yeah, wallowing in self pity. Like you, you mentioned, you know, you keep yourself busy in London building lofts, or you put yourself in your room, learn the American accent. Yeah, so you're always sort of moving forward. Yeah, 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 yeah. Take action, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, but it, but it's always something you can do. It's not an instinct to a lot of people though to take action. But it seems like it just is for you. It's just it's a like logical. Yeah, I think it's a logical. But I've always, I've always been like that. I think from from the earliest age you know like mm. when i started sailing i was terrible mm. i was terrible i would last every time and i remember crying because I, I couldn't get over the start line and I, everyone else was sailing off and I was, I was doing everything they told me with the rudder and the main sheet and the, <laughs> which way is the wind coming from and what side of the boat am i be on and i could 
and a, my center board had got stuck around the, the line where the, the, the boy, the start boy was. And, you know, one of the parents came over with a little tinny and an outboard and lifted my center board and off I went. Um, so I, but I was like, right, I'm going to, I don't know, I just got to figure this out. Like, there's got to be a reason why something's not working and what is the reason, once you figure out what the reason is, and it's like, okay, well then, how do you make it work? What do you need to do? What What's required, you know? Um, mm. So I think it's just, it's 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 a logical thing. Yeah, well, failure More is, than a personality, failure, it's just, yeah. it's... Um, yeah. What? What's? Mm. What? What can you? Do, what can you actually do? Um, and there's usually something you can do to progress yourself. Yeah. 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 Of course. Um, you mentioned Wind Talkers before, and you said the Nick Cage movie. Um, hell of a cast. Also, Christian Slater, Mark Ruffalo. Yeah. Yeah. Hell of a movie. Brian so, Van Holt. Yeah. Yeah. So you, a lot you're of a, you're, you have much to do with those guys. So you're in a trench hanging out with them. Yeah. Yeah. That was a lot of fun. It was. Uh, it was a lot of waiting around. It was one of those jobs, you know. John Woo is spectacular director and, and some of those sequences were so huge and sophisticated with all the pyrotechnics and the special effects and the planes and the tanks and the true massive, massive um, setups for some of these shots. Um, but the waiting, the waiting around for that is, is brutal, you know, mm. as an actor. And then the weather might not be right or there'll be one bomb or the plane was too low or too high or he didn't like the way some soldiers died, you know. And so then another half day set up to get it all set up again. And so that movie was fun, but it was also a lot of boring time just waiting <laughs> but, around. But that, you must have just been relieved to be on a set because... I loved it. This is like your first sort of proper break? Y yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. Um, yes, yes, Definitely. And it was, you know, we got to do boot camp. They put us, I think it was only a week, but we did a week of proper boot camp in Hawaii at the barracks and we had a proper drill sergeant and they treated us the way they treat soldiers. And we did all the physical routine and ate the chow and weapons training and all the confidence courses. And You, you know, must have been like, this is nothing. I've been detained at LAX. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it made my New York days feel like a... <laughs> a yeah, but... Um, um, and uh, yeah, you mentioned like the the, te the the movie Loser before with um, Zoe Deschanel that you missed out on. Yeah. Did you also did you did you meet with Spielberg from Minority Report or no? I met. F yeah, man, you have done your research, bro. Oh, this yeah. is stuff that I don't even remember. Uh, I met with Spielberg. Oh gosh, I don't know if they even told me the project. To be honest. Um, so you you missed out on the role that Colin Farrell got. Is that right? Possibly, right. but I don't. I I don't know. I never. I never asked right. what but it was you, for. But I was you're just so auditioning to Steven Spielberg. Well, I, I just met him. Yeah, I, I came and someone told him that he should meet me, and um, he was getting ready to do presumably that movie. I actually don't know. I never. I never inquired as to what it was about specifically. Um, yeah, if it's a Spielberg movie, you just want to be involved. <laughs> I mean, uh, absolutely. Shit, well, is Spielberg. Yeah, or just the guy. opportunity to meet him yeah. too. I, for me, it was more about oh, I get to sit down. Aside from will I get a job when I get a job, it was just an honour to sit in his office and and chit-chat, you know. And, and as you know, he's got a, a huge interest in World War II. And um, like I said, my grandfather flew for the – the, the Air Force and um, he was in bombers and so I shared with him my understanding of my grandfather's participation and and, um, and he was quite curious about New Zealand. He asked me a lot of questions about New Zealand and um, but yeah, but it, it didn't it didn't eventuate to anything. It didn't lead to anything, but still No, really but it was just awesome. It was just great. It was <laughs> like, okay, this is yeah, there's, there's been moments like that, I guess, in, in my life and my career where you're just in certain situations and with people and you're like, Wow, this is It's insane. This is exciting. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. It's cool. It is, yeah, because you would have been like seven years old when E. T. came out. Yeah. <laughs> I US. cried my eyes out when the little heart light went out and the Neil Diamond <laughs> song. The oh, my God. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's a Grey's Anatomy as well. You were Dr. Nathan Riggs. Yes. Um, do you have quite a good relationship with um, Shonda? Yes. Shonda Rhymes. You've been in a yeah. couple of her shows. Yeah, yeah. Shows. She's been very, very good to me. Um, Shit. I've actually done, gosh, I've done at least two pilots that didn't even make the air and then I did a short lived show off the map that she produced uh, and then yeah Grey's Anatomy so 
Yep. Yeah. How, is, uh, how, how, how was that? Thank it's you, a, Shonda. It's an iconic TV show, and you were uh, Meredith Grey's boyfriend for a couple of years. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I think, you know, they... they, they Derek, the character of Derek uh, died, um, and so I think they, they desperately wanted to put someone in there to give Meredith some continuing love interest, you know? Um, so, I th and I think partly because, well, I'd been traveling a lot too. I remember I took that meeting. She was doing, Shonda was doing two shows at the time. She was starting a new show that I think was being shot in Vancouver, uh, which actually sounded pretty cool. Uh, and they were wanted to cast a doctor for Grey's. And she just said to me, what, what do you want to do? And I said, honestly, I've been on the road my whole life. I've spent years living out of a suitcase in a strange town, trying to figure out where the good cafes are. Uh, you know, I, I would love to just be in LA for a while. I just want to be at home. And so she's like, okay, you can do Grey's Anatomy. I was like, okay. Um, so that's wow. kind of how that went. Yeah. And then I got in the car and I drove home and my manager called and said, how'd the meeting go? And I was like, it went great. I think she just offered me the, the role of uh, on Grey's Anatomy. And they're like, really? I'm like, yeah. And they're like, oh, cool. And then I realized... I don't know what the role is. So I called her back and I'm like, hey, just before I say yes, what exactly am I doing? I don't, we never discussed the creative here. You just, and she said, I don't know, you'll be a doctor. We'll figure it out. You know, I was like, okay. So that was. That's amazing. Yeah. Was, like she's, she's a queen. She's the yes, TV she, queen. She is a juggernaut. Shit. Yeah. So, no, yeah. you know, you'd assume that there would potentially be work in the future from her as well. Maybe, yeah. I mean, you know, I don't, don't, uh, presume anything mm. in this business ever yeah. um i mean i'd love to yeah obviously work with her she's incredible yeah um, she, she even wrote the britney spears movie crossroads which i think oh i didn't know that oh, didn't you? oh no okay yeah crossroads gray scandal how to get away with murder bridget in inventing anna the yeah. anna delphi story oh, yeah know, scandal so, i mean so, so much, much so much yeah it's incredible yeah, yeah. speaking of that so the do, do you, does it piss you off that um like 20 years on or whatever it is that you know, people still talk about the Britney thing. I mean, it's such a... No, I find it funny. I mean, it's, it's you know... It's a, nothing, it's a nothing role though, right? It's just like I mean, 30 I, seconds at the end of the Toxic I, music video. Yeah, it doesn't press me. I think I just find it confusing because... the So the context of that, which I, I try to share with people, uh, was not me going, I want to be in a Britney Spears video or, or this, is an, <laughs> this is an interesting role. Um, it was purely promotional because I had done a movie for Warner Brothers called Talk which was sort of around the time of Fast and the Furious. It's supposed to be mm, sort of Fast yeah. and the Furious on wheel, two wheels, you know. Um, we shot the movie. The, the guy who directed it was a first-time feature director by the name of Joseph Kahn. And Joseph was Britney's main uh, music video director. So he had done all of her cool... And he's very, very, very talented. So he, we shot the movie. It was being edited or it had been edited and it was about to be released. And I think Joseph went back to doing Toxic. For, for Britney and someone at Warner Brothers went, hang on a second. So we've got the director of our movie who's directing the new Britney Spears movie. Why don't we put Martin in the Britney Spears video and then we can do a, I think they did a MTV behind the scenes type thing, making of the video and it'll be a promotion. It'll be like a cross promotion and we'll promote uh, talk. So I got a call and they said, it was like a Thursday night. And they're like, what are you doing this weekend? I'm like, nothing. And they're like, do you want to come to Warner Brothers on Saturday to a soundstage and be in a Britney Spears video to help promote the film? And so I was like, sure. Um, I mean, that was my main goal was to promote the movie that I had done. You right, know? Right. Um, and, and no disrespect to Britney. I was, I was honored to be in it and it was a lot of fun. And I got to say, she, I know she's, Interesting enough, very shortly after we did that video, her life took a, a, a much darker, rougher turn that she just seems to be getting out of now. Oh, with the conservative ship thing? Yeah, but, you know, she was struggling. Mm, right after that, it. there was yeah, a... Right. Yeah, yeah, poor thing went through so much. But I, I got to meet her right before all that happened. And um, she, she is the nicest, sweetest, most genuine, just down-to-earth, good old Southern girl, you know? Um so it was sort of heartbreaking mm. to, to witness all of that other stuff 
unravel um because mm. my experience was she was just delightful yeah i just listened to um her book on audible last week it's been oh cool a, fuck it's a hell of a life yeah I Shit, bet. like the stuff that her her dad and the people minding her have got away with for like over a decade it's astonishing it's like a horror movie it's like a th- it's like a <laughs> oh, yeah mate I'd, it's just outrageously bad but yeah. that's um yeah that's a fun video but it's uh it's like it's not even really acting is it it's no 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 that's why i love i'm like why are we talking about that um it was yeah but yeah that, that's why i wonder if it, if it annoyed you i think uh, you, you came onto my no. radio show like maybe 10 years ago and we talked about it and i think i we, we joked about whether you got an erection during it or whatever and it's like i look back now and it's like your body of work is so massive it seems like Almost like a disrespectful thing to bring up in a way, because it's just a nothing. Well, yeah, I think it's just, it was not acting. It wasn't intended to be acting. It wasn't, so I, don't, I never viewed it as a part of my career so much as a, promo, a, a publicity stint. Um, but I think people, because she's such a big star, people kind of saw it as sort of something that I consciously chose to be and maybe for the, the I don't know, the credibility or the, mm. the exposure or something, which hadn't occurred to me i just i just wanted the making of the video to to, to be able to promote yeah. the movie um which yeah. wasn't a great movie but so i don't think any any promotional thing would have probably helped in hindsight <laughs> when, you, when you when you're filming a movie or a tv show do you know it's uh, do you know it's bad at the time or do you when you're doing it do you think this is going to be the best thing ever and it's not till afterwards that you go uh. you really you really don't know um because there's so many so many factors that are outside of your control or that you're just not privy to that you can't see so you're sort of you do your you do your part to the best of your ability and then you have faith that everybody else involved is going to do their best and then maybe the collectively you've produced a product that is the best version of what the script promised but of course there's so many variables that come and go along the way yeah. that you're just you just have to wait and see and sometimes it can be the editing can be terrible sometimes um i mean as silly as it sounds even the sound is so important i tell the story because it's really illuminating i think for anyone who's working in in storytelling and in and, and, and audio visual medium is when i did the ring for for DreamWorks, and I was actually shooting talk when the when uh, the ring was about to be premiered, and they flew me out um, to to watch the, the sort of the the final cut of the movie. There was a couple of scenes that they still had to shoot with, like a couple of reshoots with Naomi and the horse or something, um, but essentially it was the exact picture. It was the same movie, however the score was was a temp score because they were still finalizing that in London or something. So in, in the meantime, the director had placed um, adequate sound in order to give you a sense of what he wanted in each moment. The movie, w- I walked out of that screening with my uh, my publicist at the time and my agent. And of course, we were so excited because it was a DreamWorks movie. It was a cool script. It was Naomi Watts who just won a, a Golden Globe for Mulholland Drive. And this movie could really be something. And we were so depressed. We walked out of that screening. We sat down and we're like, okay. Ironically, we're like, well, at least we got talk coming out soon, <laughs> which turned out to be not a very good movie. Um, and this is true. So about a month later, the movie's finally finished. It's being premiered. They helicopter me in. We were shooting out in the Mojave Desert. And in order to leave set and get to the premiere and get back, they had to helicopter me, which was so exciting and I'm, and I'm in this helicopter and you see the 10 freeway and the desert lights and and we we land in la and i get my suit and i go to the premiere but i because i had seen the 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 temp score version of the movie i was a bit embarrassed about the final product and i didn't feel confident going on the red carpet and saying oh this movie's so great because I, I just i felt like i'd be lying so i i avoided some of the press went along the press line went in sat the, sat down started watching the movie and about 15 minutes in my agent reaches over and he grabs my arm and he goes bro he was a kiwi he goes bro this movie's really good and i'm like you're right and the only difference was the score wow and that goes to show you how imperative the right sound design and yeah. music is to eliciting the right 
uh, emotional, emotional feeling. Yeah, yeah. It was a huge lesson. And, and that was a huge movie, right? That was massive. That was huge. Turned out, yeah, I mean, I, I, probably one of the most successful movies I've ever been in. Mm. Um, yeah. So there you go. That's awesome. I don't know what that means, but it's just yeah. to make sure your score is really good if you make a movie. Yeah. So uh, why, why the um, sobriety? Was there a moment? Was there a pivotal moment? Was there a night? Was it just like an, an, an ongoing thing? Did you just get bored of getting I, wasted? It, was it, it? it was a long... Um, when I was shooting a show for South Pacific Pictures back in 1990 or 89, um, I think it was 1990, Andy Anderson played my dad and Andy... Uh, had been sober quite a while and took that part of his life very seriously. And at the rap party... Oh, hello, hello, Kanye. Oh. Hello, Baba. Oh, hello. Hello, oh. beautiful boy. Oh. 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 Hello, Kanye. Oh. Hello, Kanye. Oh. Sorry, just as we're um, getting into quite a serious story. Yeah, no, 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 it's all good. Um, My ex just dropped him off. She's been dog sitting. Oh, you guys just got shared custody? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, we take oh, it very seriously. Beautiful, hey, good beautiful. Boy. Hey, buddy. Hey. Oh, you're friendly. Oh, Hi, you're Martin. Am I interrupting? Oh, hey. Oh. How's it going? Hi, oh, Martin, yes, JJ. You know, how you doing? Oh, I thought I'd just pop up and say hi. <laughs> hi. How are you? <laughs> hi, how are you? <laughs> Sorry, I put an interrupting thing. Who no. wants the oh. trim latte? I didn't oh, I'll, I'll take Oops. the trim latte. You should have No, no, I'm good. I've got... I've, Got my water here. Thank you. Really sorry, guys. This looks amazing. Okay, great. To right. see you. <laughs> see ya. Lovely to meet you. Bye. Bye. Thanks Bye. for dropping by. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. So, um, Andy Anderson. So Andy Anderson pulled me aside at the rap party, and he goes, "Hey, Martin, you want to you want to come outside and see my motorbike? He drove a big fancy 1100 cc motorbike." And I was like, "Oh yeah." So I go out, and we're you know, admiring the engine and the muffler and the. Uh, and then he just sort of says to me, he said, listen, I'm going to tell you something now. I was 15 at the time. So I'm going to tell you something now and you're not going to believe me. And that's fine. I don't need you to believe me right now. But one day you're going to, you're going to remember this conversation. And he said, you have a problem with alcohol. And you, you were how old at the time? I was 15. Right. And he had... Had you even started drinking at that time? <laughs> yeah, and I okay. started drinking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, there was a reason he said it. Yeah, right. <laughs> um... Uh, yeah, and and so and of course, yeah, true to his word, I didn't believe a word he said. I thought he was out of his mind. I mean, mm. I thought this this guy was nuts. A little, you know. I mean, what's he talking about? I'm, yeah, what made him single single you out? Do you think? So I'm guessing at the age of fifteen, you were drinking no differently to any of your peers. Some of my peers, yeah. yeah but I think, I mean, I was definitely displaying a a, a like for alcohol that went beyond what he okay. saw as just a social interaction, you know? Right. And, so and maybe he could see see himself as a young man and you. Yeah, or even himself as an older man, okay. you know? I just, yeah. just that yeah. those traits, you know? And um, so that that was the first time that it had been brought to my attention that maybe my relationship with alcohol was not a, a healthy one. And then um, you kept going for another oh, 12 oh, years. Oh, mate, did I ever? I mean, it, it fell on deaf ears. I was, yeah. I was not even, uh, I couldn't even begin to accept that as anything other than hogwash, you know. It's, it stuck with you, right, didn't it? it that, but in hindsight, it did, yeah. yeah. But I mean, I was like, well, whatever, Andy, good on you. Um, but there were, there were other instances and people who also pointed out um, that maybe I needed to look at it. Um, and I think the most effective one was when I was in Sydney before I left Australia to move to New York. And as I said, I was working with this woman, Annie Swan, who became a, a mentor of mine, really. Um, and she, she also sort of said, you know, you have everything going for you whereby you can create a really wonderful life. She said, you, you're talented, you you, you're, you're smart, you, 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 you literally can have a really great life. She said, but the one thing that could interfere with that or limit the kind of life you can live is, is your, your, your alcohol use. Mm -hmm. And um, I think because I'd been working with her so intensely for, so, for a couple of years by that point, I had so much love for her and I knew she had 
genuine love for me. There was such mutual respect that 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 hit me in a way that I knew that that woman was would only ever say that because she truly thought it was was right, mm. um, and it, and it just landed in a way, uh, and she she suggested I go with another student of hers that would come who was studying Shakespeare and go to a meeting. And this guy, he was an older actor and, and he took me along to a meeting up at King's Cross or somewhere. And um, so I went along kind of rolling my eyes like, oh, whatever. I'll Cynicism. Yeah, I yeah. thought, I thought I'll, I'll sort of appease Annie, you know. Um, but, I, I, you know, I sat in that meeting and, and there was a woman, funnily enough, who got up. And that's what kind of surprised me because I thought, oh, maybe there's a dude that gets up there that I relate to. But this was a... A female woman older than me and she just spoke honestly about her true relationship with alcohol and um and her life and and what her life had been before she got sober and what her life was now that she was sober and i uh, just this 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 light went off and and it hit me it hit me in that deepest part of myself mm. that i knew that you know i related and i went oh man Damn it! The party's gonna be over. <laughs> and what, was, was the party over immediately? No, like, of course okay. not. No, no, I didn't want the party to end. I love a party. Yeah, I love the party more than as much as anyone. Uh, what was it? Just alcohol? Or was it co a little bit of coke? Oh, it was a little bit of drugs in Sydney. Um, right. Yeah, over those years. Um, but it was yeah, it was really just alcohol, and it was. Part of it was but, but like, I, I didn't mean, want cocaine and drugs are sort of like a supplement to help you drink more, aren't they? Really? Yeah, and it was just yeah. sort of yeah. You yeah. just keep going. I would, I just didn't want the party to end. That mm. was it for me. It wasn't. Um, I wasn't like an angry drunk, or yeah. it, it was. If anything, so there was no I was rock at, bottom or anything. No, but there was. There were definitely after that sort of moment of like, oh, she might have a point. I attempted sobriety on my own. I, 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 I think I clocked up five months actually after I left. Um, I think, yeah, was it? I think, you know, just before I left Australia, I, um, I, I think I did six, uh, five months of sobriety on my own. Um, and it was quite amazing. And even those five months were sort of a revelation. I'd wake up on a Saturday at like eight, you know, instead of 11 and, and clear headed and, and I remember I went out for a walk and there was a, someone was having a, a garage sale and there was all this kind of cool old furniture and I bought a couple of pieces for, for 10 bucks and went home and sort of got a, started working on it and, and sanding it and painting it and kind of I got creative. I just found like instantly there was this relationship between me not drinking and how much more of myself was available to mm. to be creative or... Um, so many more productive hours in the day. Yeah, it's funny. Eh? Yeah, I've heard Bradley Cooper talk about the same thing. And just he's how, sober. Yeah, he's been sober for like twenty odd years. And okay, cool. just just the impact it's had on his life and career. And um, I heard a podcast with Steve-O. You know Steve-O from Jackass. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and he talked about how um, addiction and alcoholism is the only illness where. When you get rid of it, your life gets so much better. He said, if you have cancer, all you want to do is get back to how you were before. Yeah. But he said, alcoholism and drug addiction, it's the only thing. When you give it up, your life is going to get better. Oh, yeah, infinitely. Mm. Yeah. Do you it's, miss it, though, at all? Or not now? It's been so long. No, I mean, no. I mean, I, I can kind of think back to some of the <laughs> fun times, you know, and sort of go, oh, that was, that was fun. But I think about... The, the times that I've had since sobriety, the quality of those, t you know, I mean, the, 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 the sort of the deeper experience of myself and my relationships, my career, my work, my health, um, everything, finance, just the, the way you make decisions. I just feel like I would never give up that for uh, mm. a bit of a laugh, you know, and I can yeah. still have a laugh anyway. So, no, there's no like kind of like, oh, Oh, man that was those were the days no i mean it yeah. was fun it was definitely fun and and i think i'm fortunate that i got to have some of those fun crazy you know debauched moments at an age where you know i didn't have too much to lose and i didn't yeah. continue that on into you know a broken marriage or a failed career or a failing health or <laughs> dic or, or, or yeah or the, yeah th you know, criminal you know, all those things that that are sometimes a consequence mm. of it so um 
yeah, but I feel lucky that I just had people in my life that I loved and that loved me enough that I was, that they were able to tell me that truth and I was open to it. Um, and I'll ever forever be grateful for that because mm. um, I think I, on my own, I was in denial. I just thought I was having a good time and I didn't want anyone to take away my toys, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, of course you didn't. Yeah. Um, I know you're, you're um, a reasonably private guy. But you my private, I guess I'm private about, uh, yeah, that, that part of my life. I don't know why. I think maybe because I got famous so young in New Zealand and I felt like by the time I was 17, I, I just felt so exposed that, and, and by virtue of what I do, there's always going to be that public element mm. um, that some of that stuff feels like it should be, some of your private life should be sacred, sacred somehow. 100%. Otherwise it's all for, I don't know, like it's up for gossip or titillation or not that I'm hiding anything. It's just sometimes you want that to be between you and, and, and the people that that you're really mm. close to and private, private, not secret, I guess is. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Oh, that makes perfect sense. From my years of um, like doing breakfast radio, you find the more of yourself you give away, you form more of a connection with the audience. Um, but I, JJ, who right, you met just right. before, we, we gave away so much of ourselves. <laughs> you know, you talk about your infertility struggles and things yeah. like that. And once you've given it away, you can't take it back again. Yeah. And I think, I mean, it's, we live in a weird time too with social media where now it's, it's sort of, it's rude de guerre to just unburden every aspect of your life either through images or video or commentary or, or comments or you know people getting into argument you know i just find it it, it, it really odd maybe because i spent my lo most of my life in the public view to me it just it just seems odd to share everything mm. but, but 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 the counterpoint is too there's this wonderful uh, access that we have to people. Like one of the things I hated about being a young actor was the idea that you'd, you'd go to work, you'd put the costume on, you'd perform, you'd help create a product that hopefully people enjoyed. And then you had to go and promote it. And the way you had to promote it just felt so false that, you know, that you wear these clothes that a stylist has bought that you'd never fucking wear. And they do your hair in a way that you'd never, and then you're, you're sort of, and it's, it was all this sort of, bullshit that i hated i hated it with a passion it just felt so fake uh and i was like but my job's to be real my job is to get in front of a camera and try to pretend the camera's not there and be as real as i can about the human condition that this particular character is experiencing and now i've got to i've got to kind of be full of shit to sell it and i i hated that so much and i actually quite like that with social media now there's this immediate connection to your fans where it's just you being you and they actually want you, you they'd, they'd be more interested in seeing you roll out of bed, you know, and, and have a have a bowl of porridge and talk about what you're doing that mm. day and be very candid and real than the sort of over-manufactured, glamorized version of yourself. Yeah, and you're, you're very good at that. You've got um, like over one million followers on Instagram. Um, you've just, you're back here in New Zealand working on a couple of New Zealand shows, including um, one that my ex-girlfriend uh, works on, My Life is Murder. And she was telling me just how... Is she the one that dropped the dog off? Oh no 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 no! Uh, it's, no, okay. no this, this is Liz. She's um oh, walks. I don't know what she does. But walks around with a like a like a belt with a walkie-talkie on. It's AD. Yeah, uh, AD. Yeah. Um, but she she talked about just how how gregarious and wonderful you were on the set, and how on day one, you know, you you ask if you're allowed to film and what you're allowed to share. Yeah, you share it on social media, and for a little New Zealand production with some New Zealand on air funding, I think they would have been frothing about that. Oh, good, good. Well, I, I hope. So, I mean, I felt important for me as a Kiwi, you know, growing up here, it's, and my, and most of my, my career obviously has been in, in the States since, well, since leaving Australia, but I think, yeah, being from here and being, still being connected to the local industry and trying to support that is important because I feel like that, as I've talked about all day today, has been a big part of my sort of journey and, and, and. And where I've ended up is is, is because I've come mm. from here, you know, and what I learned here, and the way I, the opportunities I was given yeah. at a really young age, and how I was supported. So, mm. yeah, I'm glad. 
And what are you up to after this? Not this podcast specifically, but when you leave New Zealand again, are you season six of season Virgin six River? of Virgin River? Yeah, we w- weren't you reluctant to do that in the beginning? You got off at Virgin River. I guess this was five years ago, and you you were dragging your heels. Uh yeah. I there was there was a version of it. You know, it, it was no secret that it was it was derived from um, a romance novel, um, and not being a one who reads romance novels or watches shows that are like that I, I i wasn't that aware but i i knew enough that there could be a really bad version of this um <laughs> so i had some reservations about how how the show would be presented and how the characters would be presented and i felt it was imperative that well at least my role was the only thing i could control felt uh that it had some substance to it and some depth and some believability so yeah, I had some. I definitely had some reservations about it, um, but you know. But the writers I, and I called them, and I'm like, yeah, I'm not really not sure. And they they said, look, we we understand, but we we really do want to make this character as interesting as we can. And and they sort of put some of my fears to bed. And then you know, and then you roll the dice, man. You still don't know if they're they're just telling you what you want to hear to get mm. you involved. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's been wildly successful. You, you yeah. must feel that yourself. But also, Netflix don't fuck around. Like, if a show's not working, it's not going to get another season. Simple as that. Yeah, so yeah. So you can't argue with um, five seasons going into number six. It's phenomenal. Yeah, it's, it's nuts. Super successful. Yeah, yeah. You, which um, so yeah, Grey's Anatomy that was probably, you know, huge for your fan base as well. You must have noticed like a, like a you know a, a, a tick, rise or, and, or a new sort of demographic or new sort of fan base. So you find the same thing again with Virgin River. Yeah, diff- different demographic. Yeah. Um, I mean, what's interesting about Greys is that it's been around for so long that the a huge amount of its resurgence is due to the fact that it was released on Netflix and it found all these teenagers. So that's part of why, you know, I've, I've got younger audience like that. But the audience for Virgin River, I think, skews, uh, you know, old, uh, way older than that. Mm. Um, but... It, at first, I thought Virgin River was going to... I understood why, you know, and, and a lot of the fan bases, older women, um, grandmothers and all that, and, uh, you know, and there's a wholesome <laughs> sweetness to it, and I understood its appeal. Uh, so that wasn't really a shock. Um, but more and more was just how many younger people like the show. And dudes, like, what's surprising to me, I don't really have them reaching out on Instagram. There's not a lot of dudes... You know, it's sliding into your DMs. No, but but out and about, you know, you'll be somewhere and you'll check into an Airbnb and 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 the owners might be there. I'm like, oh wow, you know, and and the husband are like, oh, we love your show, man, we love watching your show, and I'm always really pleasantly surprised that it has that wider appeal because I just didn't really foresee it having having quite mm. the attraction that it that it that it does. So. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And you never know, man. I mean, that's the thing, eh? You know? Um, y- yeah, you're always sort of rolling the dice with what what, what the show, you know, will end up being and if it'll do well and what that means for your life. Mm. So there's, you're always improvising with your own life. Like now and Vancouver's become this huge part of my life for it could be half worse. a decade. <laughs> yeah, Vancouver's not bad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, the money must be sensational after five seasons. It's getting better. It's yeah. Getting better. Yeah. It's getting better. They, um, yeah. Yeah. We're, it's not friends money yet, but. No. And I don't, well, I think given that Netflix is not a network show, it can't be syndicated in the way that those shows mm. were and, and are. Yeah. Although I think part of that discrepancy is being addressed with the latest round of the union yeah. negotiations. So I think there is now a provision for sort of a residual type um, compensation to actors that are in shows that are proven to be of a certain level of success, but how the, how the equation works out and how they actually quantify a, whether you meet a threshold and then how you get paid accordingly. I don't, I haven't understood Mm. that math yet, but I think there may be an opportunity now with the new contracts that we, because we don't see a cent, even though the show's, wildly popular in Israel and the UK and France and Belgium and Brazil and the Netherlands and New Zealand. You don't see a cent of that. Are oh, um, you like a flat rate? You're acting you, money and that's it. Yes. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. Which, you know, obviously is not, 
as as good as what it, it was. <laughs> it's not how David Hasselhoff made his money on no, Baywatch. No, no, exactly. <laughs> and that's just because we're in this new era of streaming yeah. and, and, and it's a different uh, business model. So um, hopefully, you know, if the show continues to, to keep its appeal, then we may get some something from that, though, from the international yeah. success, yeah. God, it's been a blast sitting down with you today. Oh, you, oh you are, thanks, brother. It feels like you, you're in such a good place. You're so comfortable in your own skin. You, you, you know who you are. You know what you are. You're not trying to prove anything to anyone. Yeah. Um, it yeah. seems like life's good, and it seems like life's been good for you for a long time. Thanks, man. Um, yeah. life. I mean, I, I, I fundamentally, fundamentally have always believed that life itself is good, and I've sort of tried to orientate myself to that belief um and yeah it, and it has been good good to me and again you know talking about the sobriety thing too i think um that was also a huge mm. turning point too where i think i started being good to myself in, in a really real real sense and able to look at myself and you know i i went into therapy too there was a lot of stuff and we we talked about the divorce things and a lot of these issues that I think I had growing up that um, unexamined were sort of fears of mine around relationships and um, just, you know, the, the classic sort of stuff that when it's hidden in the dark and I was drinking to sort of try to avoid... Facing it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, then, and then when I stopped that, kind of ripped the Band-Aid off and through the help of, you know, a therapist was able to really look at some of these things that were plaguing me that were deep down that I was terrified to look at. And then you, you bring them to the light of the day and they're just, most of the time they're just your, your, your feelings, or your thoughts, you know, and sometimes they're based on, on fear and they're not real. And, and to be able to sort of shed light into that part of my life, I think has allowed me to, yeah. Grow into the person you are today. Yeah, and accept myself and, and love myself and be comfortable and, um, and sort of, also think realize that it's not all about you i think i i, I work in a in an industry and <laughs> in a in a particular job that is can be very much all about you and i i kind of work to sort of not make that a reality because i think you know there's so much more at play and looking at the bigger picture mm. spiritually and and um within a community and sort of sort of trying to get out of yourself more i think helps yeah. me keep a really good perspective on, on it all. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, when was the therapy? Was that late 20s? Was that after the sobriety? Yes, it was... I'm trying to think if I went... I think I... Did I go to a th therapist before I got sober? I might have sat down... No, it was actually... When I got sober, I was in a relationship. We were arguing a lot. And we both wanted it to work but we didn't seem to be able to make it work. And she suggested that I go with her to her therapist and see if we could figure it out, which I thought was really unfair. I'm like, oh, I don't want to go to your therapist. Because <laughs> she's going to be on your side. And you know, what about why we choose my therapist or a neutral one? But anyway, I put my ego aside. I went along and, um, uh, and that was, yeah, that was the sort of the start. Um, we ended up breaking up, but I actually kept going to see the therapist. Um, because she helped me see that I was just shooting myself in the foot, you know, mm, I wasn't self sabotaging. Yeah, 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 and I and I had a lot to learn. I, had, I mean, man, I had a lot to learn, and I had to grow up and um, and face stuff, and and um, yeah. So it's that was that was sort of the beginning around twenty seven. Yeah, has yeah. your mental health mostly been good over the years? It has since then. Yeah, yeah really. Yeah, Interesting. yeah, but like, like I said, with support, you know, um, and I've struggled, you know, I definitely have had periods where I felt I struggled with anxiety for a while and some depression, and um, and I had to really do a lot of a lot of self work, you know, and really examine what what was going on and was it anxiety and depression that was sort of understandable like when you're going for two two to three years without any work or was it sort of unexplained i think some of it was was sort of existential sort of yep. just um 
maybe related to that, maybe being in relationships that weren't healthy and sort of like feeling like, oh, I've got to make it work and being in denial about mm. them. And, um, and, but then sort of, and then it's easy to say, well, well, clearly it didn't work because she this or, but it's like, well, why was I choosing that? You know, yeah. what, what is it in me that is not being examined why I thought that was a good idea in the first place? What level of denial, or, you know, um, and why would I, cho- why would I think that I, I would, why would I choose that for myself? You know, if I was really mm. taking care of myself, I'd actually make a much wiser decision. So what are, what are the things that are operating in, in me that are still holding me back from actually treating myself in the best possible way? And yeah. why don't I love myself enough? You know, so what am I holding on to? What, what sort of self flagellating judgments am I carrying on and, and where did they come from? And that's where therapy for me helped me go like, Maybe it was something, you know, a parent said or did or didn't do or didn't say that I felt like should have happened or didn't. And, and then realizing how, how as, a, as a man, I'm still carrying on with sort of seven-year-old Marty's wounds and I'm carrying that out into adult relationships and thinking they're going to be healthy. And, you know, so there's, I mean, that, yeah, there's been a... It's, it's a lot. It's like it's, pull, pulling a strand of cotton on a T-shirt. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But... And, and I think it always continues. I'm still challenged by some of my attitudes, you know, in relationships today where I'm like, oh, that's, you know, that's not healthy. I need to choose, a, you know, a healthier way of conducting myself or expressing myself. And, um, and it takes humility because then it's, you know, the ego gets involved mm. and it's hard to admit that you're, you're, you're wrong and um, you have to grow up. And, but there's no way around it, right? You just got to go through it and... Yeah, keep learning absolutely. and keep working, keep yeah, grinding. Yeah, totally. Yeah, keep trying to be better than the day before. Absolutely. Yeah. Do, do you? You've never been married, eh? Do, do, no. Do you want? You want to get married? Would you like, like to get married? Yeah, one day? yeah, I'll get married. Yeah. 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 Do you think so? Yeah. And what about um? So you, your partner at the moment, uh, she's got got kids. Yeah. Did you did you want your own biological kids or you're not fussed about it? Yeah. Do you feel I mean, like that ship sailed for you or? I don't know. I think that's one of those things that I'm sort of open to see what what life brings you know there's that famous quote by i think it was john lennon life's what happens when you're busy Busy making making other other plans plans." yeah Yeah. and sometimes i find that really true um and i'm just that stuff some of the big big stuff in life you know i i have a lot of faith and my work so my work my life works really well when i find faith and i get out of the way of some of like feeling like I've got to make things happen or I've got to control things. Just like trusting in the universe. Yeah. Yeah. And I've sort of, that's definitely one of those things that I've said, you know what, if it's meant to be, it's going to be meant to be. And as long as I approach whatever the situation is with the most amount of love I can for myself and the other people involved in any of those equations, then it tends to work out for the best. Mm. Um, So we'll see. I like that. Yeah, God, you, you're a good man. You could be a real, you could be a real dick, <laughs> and get away with it. <laughs> Why the? <laughs> What's oh, what, what for? Oh, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> I know but you, you could, but it's like you've, you've, you know, you've done the work, and you've, you know, you deserve the success that you're experiencing at the moment. Oh, thanks, um, man. And you just seem like, a, and and outside of work, you just seem like a, a fucking good bastard as well. Oh, thanks. Like a good dude. And it's been an absolute pleasure to sit down with you today. Oh, Thank man. you for being so generous with your time. Yeah, oh, it's a pleasure. And I know this has been a long time trying to get us in the room, but um, I've listened to some of the work you've done. And conversely, man, I think you, y- yeah, you, you seem to really want to put out there, you seem to have a genuine interest in the people you talk to. And I think that's some reflection of your own in- your curiosity about yourself and life and <laughs> Yeah, and I and I like that you promote. You seem to talk a bit about ma- mental health, yeah. and you're, you're actually interested in the the true human experience, not just the the, the story and the glitz and the glamour. You know, you, and I mm. think that's uh, a testament to obviously who you are, and I respect that. And so I feel like coming on a show like this feels um, feels like the right thing to do. Oh, thank you. I, I think it's just an understanding as you get older, you realize that life. For nobody is a highlights reel. <laughs> no man, yeah. <laughs> you know, there's life's a it's a messy existence, and yeah. Uh, yeah, and we're all in it. We're all, <laughs> dude. We're all in it, and I think that's one of the most amazing things that I've found from from attending uh, AA meetings and sitting in the room and and just hearing people talk and 
It could be an 80-year-old, uh, you know, Egyptian woman who's an immigrant talking about something going on in her life or her family or in her heart. And I realize, oh, my God, I'm, we're exactly the same. And mm. we really are. It's just the clothing or the accent or the, uh, the tint of your skin or what you do for a job mm. or you know, who you vote for or what church you go to or yeah, whatever. We've all got more in common than what we don't oh, have in common. Without a yeah. doubt, you know, without a doubt. So I think, yeah, if you, if you can feel comfortable enough to, to be honest about your journey, then, then maybe there's one person out there because there's been a lot of people like I've shared about today that have been honest with me or I've gleaned something from at a young age and, and been inspired by or, or educated by. So I think, it's it's so it's so important that we are transparent about our experience so that someone else out there might develop some health or, or get a, get inspired to do something or find the courage to do something or mm. um, or not or just <laughs> just just delete and move on to something they find more interesting which is cool too 100 percent. hey martin yeah. Peterson, thank you so much for your time it's been over two hours and uh i oh well i can't i can't thank you enough and i hope it's oh, been an pleasure man enjoyable and even cathartic experience for you to you know, reminisce on yeah it has uh, you brought moments. up you brought up a lot of things that i've totally forgotten about and it's nice to yeah, remember the journey you know yeah it's cool and lo long may your success continue it's quite funny when um you know, when I was like 25, 27, the same age as you got sober, um, I would have thought 50 was old as shit. <laughs> like yeah, life no. is over sort of thing. And then when you get here, you realise actually it's not. No, and there's still so much to so learn. Much. And, and and get rid of and mm. move. In. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I, I really, same thing. I was out yesterday with, the, I was at work actually, finishing work and the makeup artist was turning 40 and we were laughing about how when you're a little kid and your mum turned 40, how old that felt. And then you get there and you're like, <laughs> it's, it's not the doom and gloom that you think it's. No, no. Just got to take care of the body. I think that's, yeah. Otherwise, if that starts to go, then you, 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 your joy can diminish greatly, yeah. you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, well, thank you so much for your time. Oh, today. pleasure, it's man. Been an absolute pleasure. Yep, yep. Yeah, I appreciate Likewise. it. Likewise. Thank you.